Good morning. Welcome to CSIS. Uh, my name is John Schaus. I'm a fellow in the International Security Program. And uh, this morning, I think you're all aware, we are here to talk about what works in gray zone challenges. Uh, before we get started, I want to spend about 30 seconds giving our obligatory security announcement. We do many public events here at CSIS, and so we want to make sure in the event that something happens, we don't expect that, uh, I will be your security official. So if something happens out front, we will move out the doors to your, in front of you to my rear, uh, down the stairs and across the street, uh, either to the National Geographic building or uh, to the cathedral on Rhode Island. Um, but again, we don't expect anything to happen. So this morning we have two panel discussions talking about uh, lessons from history. And for purposes of this discussion, history begins uh, very recently, basically any time before today. Um, but drawing on lessons of our experience and history and trying to find ways to apply those to current and future challenges. Uh, our first panel will be moderated by uh, Dr. Kathleen Hicks of the International Security Program and the second panel by uh, Ms. Heather Conley who directs our Europe, uh, Eurasia and Arctic work. Last kind of throat clearing piece and then I'll get to a very brief presentation. What is a gray zone? There are almost as many definitions as there are studies. Uh, for today's discussion, we are defining gray zones as activities beyond steady state deterrence and assurance that attempt to achieve one's security objectives without resort to direct uh, and sizable use of force. In engaging a gray zone strategy, an actor seeks to avoid crossing a threshold that results in war. Easy to remember, right? Okay, so with that, let me spend just a couple minutes capturing the work that has happened here at CSIS and why we're talking about this topic today and where we're going next. So CSIS, along with many others in town, have done a great deal of work over the past several years on gray zones. Probably the most well-known study we have done is Heather Conley's The Kremlin Playbook. Uh, detailing kind of Russia's activities in uh, many parts of Europe. But it's not the only study. We've also worked on uh, how we work together with allies in Asia, US force posture in the Pacific, how to deter Iran uh, after the nuclear deal. It's kind of a dated study as of last week. Uh, <laughs> recalibrating US strategy towards Russia and how to counter coercion in maritime Asia. Most recently, there was a composition or a, a compilation piece of several authors here at CSIS looking at how to meet uh, the China challenge, looking at China's economic statecraft. So if you noticed a theme in that is it is that most of those studies were focused on actions of state or non-state actors. So they were looking at the threat vector. Um, they've also largely been studies examining what has happened abroad. But I think one, one of the things you'll hear this morning in both our first and our second panel is that um, gray zone challenges are no longer other people's problems. They aren't just happening somewhere else. For democracies, for countries around the world, they're domestic challenges as well. And so we must contend with them at home and with our allies and partners. Not just the White House, but allies and partners. So that analysis is driving a next phase of examination for our, our study effort on gray zones. And what we hope to look at are issues like, what can we learn from past competitions? How do we marry gray zone activity with a free and open democratic <coughs> governance structure? And how do we better employ and synchronize those efforts both domestically, because it requires concerted efforts at home, and with allies and partners abroad? <coughs> so where are we going currently? This isn't just the same study again, it's the Kremlin Playbook 2. The Europe program is looking at deepening and expanding its previous work looking at Russia to a broader array of challenges and uh, locations. We also have the Defending Democracies initiative led by Suzanne Spaulding, which is an effort looking at how the US judicial system is coming under uh, strain from gray zone actors and what can be done to bolster and strengthen that critical element of democratic governance. And then this morning's conversation, gray zone actions and what, what has worked. And I've talked about that uh, already. 
But specifically today, we'll talk about in the first panel examples of successful gray zone efforts or efforts to counter gray zone coercion. And then in the second panel, we'll try and move from just examples into lessons learned. What can we both domestically and, and collectively with allies and partners do better going forward? So clearly today's two panels are uh, populated with some of the leading minds and best practitioners on this topic set. Over, uh, they have extensive careers in academia, in policy making, and will bring in, I think, a, a very helpful combination of experiences and perspectives. And hope to engage with each of you as a, as a dialogue after the panel discussion. And with that, I will turn it over to Kathleen Hicks after two brief uh, final items. Uh, first, an announcement of uh, after the conference, then what? So we're going to capture the proceedings of this conference in a, a short written product, which we hope to push out uh, publicly on the internet, uh, the CSIS website, sometime later this summer. And lastly, but importantly, I want to thank the uh, Foreign Ministry of Finland for offering its support and partnership in putting together this conference. Um, and we hope to do uh, more collaboration in the future. With that, I'll turn it over to Kat. Podium. Good morning. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. We have an incredible panel here, uh, both our first panel that I'll be introducing and our second panel, and I'm sure the two topics that John just described will blend into each other a bit. Uh, uh, we're going to try to focus this in this first panel, as John said, on how uh, the U.S. has fared in the past as a gray zone uh, actor itself, both in um, its own strategy, but also in how it's responded to gray zone tactics. And as John said, history for us goes all the way up to today. So some of those historical examples may be very recent. I'm joined by an incredible panel. I'm gonna introduce them starting to my left and moving down. Um, to my immediate left is uh, Jamie Fly, the director of the Future of Geopolitics in Asia programs at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Jamie is, also works with the Alliance for Securing Democracy at uh, GMF, and he previously served as counselor for foreign and national security affairs to Senator, Senator excuse me, Marco Rubio from 2013 to 2017. He also served as his foreign policy advisor during his presidential campaign. To his immediate left, I love re referring to you all as to my left, by the way. This is <laughs> quite unique for me. It's Michael Singh. He is the Lane Swig <laughs> Senior Fellow and Managing Director at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and a former Senior Director for Middle East, Affair East Affairs at the National Security Council in the George W. Bush Administration. To his left is Kelly Maximum. She is the Vice President for National Security and International Policy at the Center for American Progress. Previously, Kelly was the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs, and while in that role, performed the duties of the Assistant Secretary of Defense. And finally, at the end, we have Linda Robinson, who is a Senior International and Defense Researcher at the RAND Corporation. Uh, Linda's current research centers on assessing the U.S. national security strategy, strategy and campaign to counter the Islamic State in Iraq and, the, and Syria political warfare by state and non-state actors, and special operations forces. Thank you all today. What we're gonna do is, I, I just wanna pose a pretty broad question and go down the line as you are seated to let each of you offer your opening thoughts on this topic. Um, but as John has already presaged, we, we really wanna get into this issue, not so much of the definitional aspects of gray zone, which we've tackled in num a number of areas, uh, other studies, but to get beyond that into where have we seen these approaches of political warfare, asymmetric tactics, uh, 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 hybrid <coughs> approaches. Um, this is not new in many ways. Uh, certainly Sun Tzu and others spoke of many of these tactics long ago. So uh, the question now is how have we seen this play out before? What are America's advantages and where have we succeeded uh, and what can we draw from that for the current uh, issues we're facing? And Jamie, I'm gonna start with you. Sure, um, thanks for uh, having me, Kath, and it's great to be up here with uh, two former colleagues, Mike and, Mike and Kelly. Um, 
And I'm, I'm really happy to be here at CSIS because you guys are doing great work in this space. And Heather Conley with the Kremlin Playbook has been a, a fantastic resource on these issues that I work on right now, uh, particularly Russian interference. So I'll briefly talk a little bit about uh, what we've been going through here in the US over the last several years. And I feel a little bit like the odd man out here because I would argue we haven't succeeded yet. Uh, we're very far from succeeding in dealing with this current challenge. And I think it, we face a basic struggle right now where I think most Americans don't even realize that we're in this fight. Uh, and so I'm going to briefly show a few examples of what uh, the tactics are that the Russians have been using in the last few years here in the American political debate and then talk about uh, briefly some lessons from the European experience. Um, it's important to recognize that this is a multifaceted effort. Uh, it's not just disinformation, which I'll show some examples in a minute. It's also financial tools, uh, funding of political parties, funding of political groups. Uh, it's also cyber attacks uh, and marrying up cyber attacks and cyber hacking of personal information then with traditional disinformation practices. We certainly saw that in, in 2016 with the uh, stealing of John Podesta's emails uh, and then using traditional media as well as uh, some of the disinformation tools to uh, propagate those uh, private emails and to use them for political effect. And so it's a multifaceted approach and we've seen this both in previous European experiences uh, and here in the last uh, 2016 presidential election and it's still ongoing. I think a few things just to uh, highlight. So I'm, I'm involved with the Alliance for Securing Democracy, as, as was said at the German Marshall Fund. It's a bipartisan initiative. Uh, my partner, Laura Rosenberger, who was uh, Secretary Clinton's foreign policy advisor, we set this up about a year ago uh, to try to tackle this problem because we feel it's incredibly important to do this in a bipartisan manner because a key part, uh, and this slide is a perfect example, you know, people, I think, often misunderstand the, the way that the Russians use disinformation. They think that it would just be traditional foreign policy propaganda. What you often see, though, is they're trying to drive political wedges and exacerbate existing divides in American society. Uh, this was from last September, which obviously shows that this is still an ongoing problem, which is something that people, I think, also fail to grasp. Uh, this, to this day, is still going on on social media in the US and US political conversations. And this was after uh, President Trump weighed in on the NFL anthem discussion. And this is a, a dashboard that we use to track social media activity on, on Twitter uh, from a number of roughly 600 linked, uh, Kremlin linked accounts uh, showing some of the hashtags that they were weighing in on uh, aspects of the NFL debate. Um, so it's very political. It's often domestic uh, topics that have nothing to do with foreign policy. Here's another example uh, from this January with the whole release the memo hashtag uh, that obviously was uh, being pushed by many, many average Americans who had strong views about this debate in the House of Representatives about a memo uh, related to the investigation of President Trump. Uh, and we saw uh, these Russian linked networks try to amplify that content. Um, I like to remind people too that these are equal opportunity. Uh, the Russians are not, in, this, in the U.S. context, about supporting one side or the other. Uh, they like to attack all sides, uh, and this was an effort to push uh, material against Senator John McCain after he voted against the Graham-Cassidy health care bill last September. We've seen them attack uh, a number of prominent Republicans, from Mitch McConnell to Paul Ryan, my old boss Marco Rubio, Mitt Romney when he got into his Senate race, uh, and so it's a common theme. They've also attacked the president and pushed material um, aimed at the Trump administration. We, while they do a lot on American politics, we see them also uh, mix that with traditional foreign policy propaganda that serves Russia's interests. And so this is a good example from last uh, November where you see topics related to Syria and Ukraine uh, linked to uh, you know, pro-Trump messaging uh, that these Twitter accounts were pushing, and that's a, a common uh, theme. In recent weeks, uh, we've seen a lot of activity related to foreign policy topics. Uh, you had the scripple poisoning in the UK and a both a covert and overt Russian effort to try to push conspiracy theories about who was actually behind the poisoning. And we've seen similar activity after the US, UK, and France uh, struck certain sites in Syria. A lot of conspiracy theories, staged videos. And the interesting thing in these cases, you can see how they marry up social media activity with Russia's overt propaganda outlets like RT and Sputnik. 
a few examples of foreign policy, other for examples of foreign policy topics. Uh, we saw a lot of activity related to the Catalonia independence referendum. We've seen them push, and this is not from Twitter, but from the Internet Research Agency, which was one of their key uh, tools used in the 2016 effort here in the U.S. Uh, these accounts have all, for the most, many of them have been identified by platforms uh, like Facebook, and this one was on Reddit, pushing a certain foreign policy message uh, about Montenegro's NATO accession. Um, so these are just a quick uh, series of highlights. I have many more in there, but I won't uh, show all of them. But you'll see them weigh in on all kinds of things from immigration to race to the foreign policy topics I just highlighted. And the frustrating thing for us is that we as a country, even though this has now been going on for several years, have really only begun to have a conversation about how to tackle uh, this uh, challenge. You can argue that this is an old problem and that the Russians used similar tactics during the Cold War, and there's a certain truth in that. Uh, active measures uh, were common in the Cold War, but we feel because of the use of social media, uh, it's fundamentally different now. We've reached a point where these tools, uh, through these tools, for very little cost, actors sitting in a foreign country can literally reach out to individual Americans, uh, and it could get even more problematic in the future as you marry up big data, hacked information. I know Kelly will talk about China in a minute. Uh, the Chinese have all already mastered uh, many of those capabilities, and if you look at what they're doing in their near abroad in places like Taiwan, uh, Australia, New Zealand, this could get uh, even scarier in the future in terms of the ability to micro-target disinformation and propaganda. So very quickly as I end, um, what's worked in Europe? Because a lot of uh, what we're trying to do with the German Marshall Fund is look at the European experience. Because I think for far too long, we thought that this was just a problem for frontline states. And now the front lines are literally inside the United States uh, on social media. Um, transparency is a key part of it. That's why we show images like this, because we need to raise awareness. And people need to understand that this is going on. Um, deterrence is a key part of it. Uh, that's also where we're very concerned with what this administration is, is not doing. If you look especially at several of the recent Western European elections, the French and German elections, and you talk to French and German officials, they believe a key part of why they were able, able to keep these tactics to a minimum were the direct, very clear threats that they conveyed to their Russian counterparts. It's not clear to us that that is happening in this case uh, here in the U.S. We've had uh, sanctions obviously imposed, led by Congress. You've had some administration officials talk about this problem publicly uh, and issue kind of vaguely worded warnings about staying out of our politics. Um, but what I think we learned from the Obama administration's experience in 2016, the warnings need to be very specific. They can't be uh, just done through intelligence channels. They need to go directly to the highest levels of the Kremlin. Uh, and they need to be repeated uh, if the uh, behavior is not changed. And uh, I don't think we're really at that point. Finally, what we need to do is we need to b build resilience, because I think another uh, lesson from the Cold War era, you can never eliminate these threats entirely. Uh, obviously, they're low cost. They're very easy to do. We have open democratic societies with inherent vulnerabilities that are going to be exploited. And so at the end of the day, you need to build up your internal defenses. Some of that's public awareness. Some of it's working with the private sector and the tech companies to make it more difficult for people to exploit their uh, platforms. Some of it's Congress taking action. And we've put out a number of uh, products at GMF highlighting all of the bipartisan pieces of legislation that have already been introduced uh, that tackle different aspects of this problem, whether it's the ability to purchase ads on Facebook or the fact that many states uh, don't have enough resources to protect their elections infrastructure. So there are a lot of things that government can do as well. And then at the end of the day, uh, we always say that civil society needs, needs to play a key role, because uh, the only way to deal with this sort of problem when you have people trying to insert certain messaging into our political conversations, especially through social media, is more informed users and more cautious users who think twice before they just believe whatever shows up on their news feed or ask questions about why something's actually showing up on, on their news feed or being shared by a friend on, on Facebook. And so uh, at the end of the day, I think building resilience is the only way that you can make yourself more immune to these threats. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Michael. Well, thanks a lot, Kath. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be on the panel with, uh, as Jamie said, former colleagues, as well as Linda, uh, who is an expert in this field. Um, you know, usually, uh, as uh, when my background's in Middle East, we're dubious about being asked about lessons learned. 
Um, we figured out a lot of ways not to do things for the most part <laughs> in the Middle East. Um, and so I, I don't want to, as, as Jamie said, characterize our record against, say, Iran or its proxies as a record of, of shining success. I, we have had some successes and some failures, um, and uh, I'll go through that a little bit. There, I do want to spend 10 seconds on the definitional question, because I think it's useful to understand what an actor like Iran does. I mean, I think of gray zone conflict as sort of a, a expanded version of hybrid warfare, right? So it's a convergence of state and non-state means across multiple domains. So we think of Hezbollah, for example, uh, as a hybrid military actor because they so seamlessly, perhaps more so than any other military actor in the world, combine high-tech tools like C-802 cruise, anti-ship cruise missiles, um, armed drones and so forth, with very low-tech um, tools, you know, guerrilla tactics, um, Kalashnikovs and so forth, often in very creative ways that we, we the Israelis, other advanced militaries uh, had never really conceived of before encountering them in the battlefield. We saw this very much in 2006. So if you expand that to include the political, um, economic, cyber, and media realms, to me that's how I think of gray zone conflict. Um, and you, you, if you expand it so much, it's easy to say, well, then everybody becomes a gray zone actor. And I think what distinguishes actors like um, Iran and its proxies uh, is the disregard for the sovereignty of states uh, and disregard for international norms, and, and it goes a bit beyond that in the sense that they're, all, they're also willing to use those concepts, principles, norms uh, to their advantage when it's convenient, but also throw them away when it's convenient. And that is, in my view, what separates them from us, is that deep cynicism uh, through which they approach their foreign policy. I think it's also, also useful to think about uh, the question of, well, why now? Well, why are we suddenly focused on gray zone conflict and not 10 years ago uh, or, or 15 years ago? Iran has, I, I would argue, been doing these things for a long time. I, I think what's different now is two things, really. One is the breakdown of national institutions. And we see this in the Middle East in a very direct way. I mean, since the Arab Spring, you've seen um, you've seen governments fall, you've seen institutions break down within these societies. Um, but I think that there's also uh, a sort of less obvious aspect of this, which maybe we think of more in our own society, and that's the development of things like Facebook and Twitter, which is a different way of national institutions breaking down, because um, instead of you know, reading your kind of uh, hometown newspaper, you're in a conversation with people around the world, and you often don't know where they're coming from, and that obviously um, has an effect, perhaps, on the fabric of a, of a society or of a local um, uh, grouping. Those things are also affecting the Middle East. So we, we tend to forget that those things affect not just us, but they also affect these um, sort of more turbulent societies, which are also dealing with the actual breakdown of their institutions. They also have Facebook and Twitter and all these things, which are vectors for uh, the influence of states like Iran and Russia and so forth. The second thing which I think is happening um, not just in the Middle East, I would argue this is with Russia and China as well, but I'll, I'll leave that to my colleagues here, is you have a resurgence of um, these sort of revisionist imperialist states that simply don't think of the states around them as having equal sovereignty. I mean, we have this notion, which is a relatively recent notion in world history, of the equal sovereignty of states. Uh, I would argue that notion is not necessarily shared by some of these um, adversaries that we're talking about. Um, I don't think that Iran necessarily looks at Lebanon and Syria and Iraq, for example, as equally sovereign um, to itself. Um, so you have um, a gray zone actor um, like Iran, which you know, operates, again, across these domains. If you look at, for example, the economic domain, you have that combination of state and non-state means. So you'll have official aid uh, in the same way that we and other states give official aid. Uh, and then you'll have these kind of uh, very micro-targeted um, efforts at economic influence, whether it's corruption and bribes and so forth, or things like wedding gifts uh, for Shia young men who are getting married and so forth. And it's you know, fascinating to think about, well, how would we respond in the United States if suddenly Russia started mailing wedding gifts uh, to people? I, I mean, who knows? I'm not sure we would know what to do about that. Um, but this is what a lot of these societies are encountering is that the Iranian effort to exert influence um, is quite pervasive. Um, it's not very expensive, but it has a, a very broad reach. And you could make that argument as well on the sort of media, uh, diplomatic, and so forth sides. If you look at um, 
how this has worked across the region. Look at the Iraqi elections, which just took place. The Hashtashabi, the, the Shia militias, the PMFs, whatever you want to call them, obviously did very well in the Iraqi elections. These, a lot of these are militias which, in one way or another, to, to one degree or another, are beholden to Iran. Um, and yet are competing also as political parties, contesting elections through um, institutions set up you know, by the West and set up to be the sort of institutions of a state. Um, and so they, uh, and Hezbollah obviously has done the same thing in Lebanon and itself did relatively well uh, in the last elections. They did well not just by contesting the elections in mean, by means that we would consider acceptable, but also through uh, mafia or criminal-like um, intimidation of the voters and of rival candidates. So if you're an independent Shia uh, in Lebanon, um, you will be getting a phone call from Hezbollah, um, and it won't be a congratulatory phone call or a sort of good luck phone call. Um, so they, they operate across these domains using both state and non-state methods, and it gives them a, um, both a plausible deniability. So we see this especially in the military realm, where, for example, we just had this, um, after the US exited the JCPOA, um, there were these short-range ballistic missiles fired from Syria into Israel, which prompted an, a military exchange between um, Iran, and, or its proxies, and Israel. Well, you had news stories initially that this was done by the um, IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard Corps, um, by its Quds Force arm, which is its expeditionary arm. But the Iranians later denied that they had done anything. They said, no, this was done entirely by Syrians. Um, and if, you, if we had done it, you would really know it, um, because it would be much more effective, presumably. Um, so, so they have this plausible deniability. And because they do operate through um, proxies, that it is plausible. And it's also, I think, meant to give us an excuse, give the adversary an excuse not to retaliate. Right? So if we're not inclined to retaliate, and we've seen this in the Russian and Chinese context as well, um, they're also giving us that room not to, not to do it. And so it works. Um, sort of doubly well for them in that sense because it seizes upon our own fear of escalation, uh, our own fear of um, getting too involved in these things. So what, it, what has sort of worked to counter all this? And of course, you know, one could go on and on with the description of Iran's activities, but I will not do that. I'll save, uh, save the specifics for the Q&A, perhaps. What has worked against this threat? I would say with Iran, because we actually have been facing this in the Middle East for many, many years now, and perhaps we've been thinking about it longer than we've been thinking about it in the Russian or Chinese context, I would say we actually have um, a little bit more experience in how to respond to it. <coughs> so one thing that we found is we really do have to use our own tools in concert as well. And it's not that we should be, um, excuse me, it's not that we should be stooping to their level. I, I think we can't do that morally, and I think it would be counterproductive. <coughs> but we do need to integrate things like our military response, with our diplomatic response, with our sanctions response, and so forth. And we need to also adapt our bureaucracy to do that. And so if you look at the US response to Iran over, I'd say, the last 12 years, 12 years ago, at the beginning of the P5 plus 1 process, we had no Iran desk officer at the State Department. Um, there was one person who shared Iran and other things in their portfolio at the NSC, uh, we had no Iran director, not even a single one. We had the, the person who preceded me as Iran director was also responsible for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in Jordan. Uh, and she did a fabulous job of all those things, but you know, it's one person, uh, three big portfolios. Um, so we not only expanded the, the amount of resources we focused on Iran, but I would say that we um, were innovative in how we molded our bureaucracy to, to cope with the challenge. So for example, now it's taken as um, a given that the Treasury Department would be at the National Security uh, Council uh, table um, for meetings at both the kind of working level and at the senior level. That certainly has not always been the case. And it, it is in large part a product of this particular threat, Iran. Also North Korea, also a couple of other things. But I would say Iran more than anything else. And it's for that reason that Treasury is now seen as a national security um, agency. As we think about all these other threats, like the, the threat of um, subversion through social media and so forth, you might ask, well, what other agencies might need to be there? I do feel like one of the difficulties in responding to something like this, which Jamie is showing us, is as you look around that table at the NSC in the White House Situation Room, it's not clearly anybody's responsibility. And then many people feel as though it's explicitly not their responsibility. So if you're the CIA, for example, you know, starting to comment on Facebook is not really what you're 
what you're uh, designed to do or are legally allowed to do, right? Um, so coming up with new authorities involving new people at the table, uh, I think has been very important. And also then structuring the process um, so that we are looking at all the different angles of the threat. Something that the Bush administration did and that the Obama administration also did was it really sort of expanded the aperture of how we look at these threats. So we would have, for example, in the Bush administration, we had this uh, Iran-Syria working group which tried to bring in a lot of different task forces to look at different aspects of the threat. Um, the Obama administration continued with those sorts of efforts. Um, I think that when you're dealing with these threats, you also have to act boldly. So there is that effort by the adversary to keep the conflict below a certain <coughs> level. Um, and we tend to cooperate in that. We tend to be ourselves deterred. And I think that oftentimes that's counterproductive, even if you can understand why we wouldn't want to risk escalation. Um, risking escalation is one thing if you're talking about Russia and China. Um, if you're talking about Iran, we clearly have sort of escalation dominance in most circumstances. And what we have found, I would argue, is when we have been willing to escalate, um, we have um, pushed the Iranians back, whether that's in the 1980s, um, uh, in, the, in the aftermath of the tanker war, Operation Praying Mantis, um, or in, say, 2007 in Iraq, where we actually finally, after much sort of gray zone conflict, um, took direct action against uh, Iranians, although even then, um, we tend to, in retrospect, kind of burnish what we actually did. We were still pretty hesitant, I would argue. But when we act boldly, I think we can, we can cause these states to um, be a bit on their back heel because their strategy is based upon the fact that they'll be able to prevent us from actually acting boldly. Um, you could look at the Russians that were, um, the Russian mercenaries in Syria that were recently engaged in a conflict with the United States and maybe make the same point. Um, I would argue that part of something we haven't done yet but we've always debated with Iran is taking the fight to the opponent's sanctuary. If we're talking strictly about hybrid warfare, um, we would say that that's very important. You know, if you have a guerrilla force, if you have a force which is trying to hide in a civilian population, for example, taking the fight to them, taking the fight, denying them sanctuary would be important. Um, when you're talking about states like Iran, Russia, and China, obviously that's a different question. But there, I think, does need to be some sense on the part of that actor that their, that their sanctuary isn't, in fact, sacrosanct, that we're not, in fact, deterred from taking direct action against them, although obviously you have to be careful uh, in how you do that. I would, I would agree with Jamie about resilient societies and institutions, and I won't say much more about that, except that if you look at where Iran is most active, it's, it's not an um, accident that they're active in the places that have weak institutions, civil wars, and so on and so forth. Um, and we often don't think about, we don't devote enough thought to the fact that there are places they're not active, and that's in part due to the fact that we have been more successful in those places uh, in helping to build institutions and helping to build uh, defenses and helping maybe less so, but uh, have push, at least pushing the message about being, about these societies embracing, for example, Shia minorities and, and so on and so forth, which there's an analogy to with Russia uh, as well. And then finally, I would say just the last bit here is to avoid complacency. I, I, I do feel like a lot of these conflicts, if you look at Ukraine, Syria, and so forth, um, are sort of strategic planning failures in a sense, where we didn't consider them core to our interests until they were core to our interests in a sense, and we didn't kind of look ahead uh, at sort of what could happen in some of these places, especially on the periphery of revisionist states like Russia, China, Iran, um, and take the necessary sort of delaying or preventative action. Um, we have, I think, done some of that in the Iran context in these working groups, looked at sort of what is the next threat that we could be facing and taking action to, to head it off. Um, but probably we need to do more of that uh, around the world. Great. Kelly, mm -hmm. China. Um, we solved China, that. China, discuss. We solved, we solved that. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of great ideas there. Um, so I'll just say a, a couple things building on the comments of my colleagues. Um, you know, I think it's really important in the context of gray zone tactics to really understand what the adversary is trying to do. Um, and I think for the United States on China, uh, it's become a, it's been a very slow <laughs> learning curve uh, for us in terms of understanding the strategic intentions of the Chinese. I think it's really important to understand that China uh, in the security realm in the Asia Pacific is certainly seeking to undermine American primacy. That is essentially their goal. They see it as a very zero sum game and they use a number of tools to try to achieve that goal. Economic tools, security tools, uh, intelligence and political tools. So they're using a big, uh, wide um, basket of, of options. 
Xi Jinping uh, has two primary objectives. One is to ensure uh, the, the, that the Chinese Communist Party remains in power and is strong. That's his uh, big objective. Second objective is to ensure that the Chinese can uh, extend a economic growth rate at where they are and get out of the middle income trap. And then the third big objective is really to undermine American security credibility um, and to reestablish a sphere of influence for them in the Asia Pacific. I think for the United States, what we have to understand is that China's playing gray zone across all of the domain, domains. They're playing gray zone in the security space, the most obvious example being the South China Sea. Uh, they're playing gray zone in the political influence space using uh, their um, you know, Confucius Institutes, their economic influence in the United States and in Europe uh, to extend political influence. And they're using it in the economic space by essentially drafting off the international system uh, and the openness of the United States and the openness of the WTO to basically achieve their economic object objectives at very little cost to them. So this is how they, this is just how they roll <laughs> across a number of, of domains. I, I figured it would be good, given I was at the Def Defense Department during a lot of the unfolding of the South China Sea, uh, I figured I'd offer a couple of, of observations uh, for what we got right and what we didn't get right in the context of both the South China Sea uh, and the East China Sea, because I think the two cases are different and have some lessons. And of course, in the cyber domain, where of course the, you know the Chinese uh, stole uh, OMB information, as we all know. OPM. The, uh, OPM. That's excuse right. me. Mm -hmm. OPM information, as we all know, we're sitting on the stage. We probably all have uh, all of our information is now in the Chinese hands. But um, I think one thing that was clear to me uh, is that uh, transparency is really important. Uh, and I think in this case of the South China Sea, I think one place we didn't do enough was really exposing uh, what the Chinese were doing. And I think part of that was you know, complications over our intelligence and what we can share and not share publicly. Um, but more importantly, I think there was definitely a sense that you know, the more you do that, the more you raise the cost on yourself, the more you raise expectations for action. Um, that you may not be able to follow through on. So I think that was definitely in the background um, and probably um, was a mistake early on. So I think we, we, we made a mistake in that space by not doing more to expose Chinese activity. The other place I think um, where I learned a lesson is I think early action, uh, and to, to Mike's point, accepting a level of risk is really important in gray zone. Um, and when I say early action, I don't necessarily mean military action. I think that's also potentially a very dangerous place to go in the context of, of um, some of these gray zone conflicts. But I think some sort of early action at the political level, whether it's a presidential engagement uh, through diplomatic means or if it's you know um, sort of an economic uh, campaign, something has to be done early on when an actor is trying to undermine the norms. Um, and the, the dominant actor, in this case the United States, needs to be able to accept a level of risk in that space. Um, I think one thing that, you know, in the case of the East China Sea, uh, the pre when President Obama came out in 2014 and declared, you know, uh, the Senkakus were under Article 5 of the Mutual Defense Treaty, that was a pretty significant move and that really, I think, set the Chinese back in the context of the East China Sea. It didn't stop all of their activity. Um, but it certainly made a, a perceptible difference uh, in terms of how they um, pursued action in the East China Sea. And I think in the case of the South China Sea, the challenge we had, of course, was in the Philippines. <laughs> um, we had a bit of a change of, a, of a administration. Duterte came in and kind of threw, you know, threw the baby out with the bathwater and um, sort of made accommodation with the Chinese. And it put us in a position, I think, where it was very difficult to be more Catholic than the Pope. Um, and so that certainly uh, set us back. Um, but I think the early security commitment, I mean, certainly clarifications probably could have been made over certain aspects of Philippine uh, territory that we could have made. Um, but of course, the UNCLOS you know, arbitral tribunal was going on at the time, and the United States was really uh, waiting uh, to try to push on, the, on that door. Um, so I think that strength in numbers is another piece I think is really important in gray zone. Uh, you know, there was a lot of focus on U.S. Uh, freedom of navigation operations. They, that became, unfortunately, the pacing factor for American credibility, which I think is unfortunate. 
Um, that's another lesson learned <laughs> in that space. Um, and of course, you know, our allies, you know, the Australians and others, um, and our European allies, I don't think we did enough to really kind of um, build a coalition around freedom of navigation. There are lots of political reasons for why capitals made their decisions, but I think, um, it, you know, strength in numbers is essential in this kind of space, especially when an actor is working outside the norm. Um, the other piece is, uh, my lesson learned on South China Sea is it's really important to broaden and lengthen your response. So the, the actor wants you to have a response in the immediate zone. So that, you know, China really was looking for some sort of US response in the South China Sea um, to sort of test our credibility. I think the key is to really widen what the US does and look at ways to push back on the Chinese across the national level on, on other interests that they may have in the, in the region and globally. Um, and to, that gives you space, it gives you decision space, uh, and it also um, raises the cost on the actor of the action they are taking by essentially saying, okay, well, if you're gonna mess here, we may mess in Taiwan. Or, so I think there's, now there's risk in that, but I also think that for an actor that is seeking to undermine um, international law and rules, there's gotta be some sort of uh, broader US government response. I think the challenge, you know, the cyber, um, the cyber situation is instructive also because President Obama really went in with a very clear and specific message to the Chinese. It was a specific threat that he intended to follow through on and it actually achieved an impact on some of their activity. I think in the South China Sea, more specificity probably was necessary uh, in terms of what we deemed un unacceptable militarization, for example, of the islands uh, and the reefs. So, and especially with the Chinese, it's very important to be clear, specific, and consistent um, in the diplomatic messaging and the strategic messaging space. Um, but those, that's, I'll leave it at that. But there's, there's lots of, I mean, the China, this is gonna be, a, like Jamie said, this is gonna be a, a problem that's gonna get worse, I think, over time. Uh, and the Chinese are doing it, not just in the security domain, but more broadly in the economic domain, which I actually think is even harder to address. Great. Linda, I failed to mention in your intro that you have just completed a book, so I get to say you wrote the book on <laughs> uh, Modern Political Warfare for RAND, along with colleagues. So uh, I should have mentioned that at the beginning, but please, over to you. Thank you, Kath, and uh, thank you all for the great work you've done here at CSIS. And I am going to uh, frame uh, my remarks with a, a quick overview of this study. Um, and then address our specific task with the panel uh, with a couple of examples um, that may uh, provide some avenues for further discussion. Our modern political warfare study is online, available free download at RAND, so you can uh, um, uh, obtain that readily if you wish. The, um, and I appreciate the definitional uh, uh, terms that you've adopted here because those roughly <coughs> approximate uh, what we ha have done in our study. And our starting point, and the use of the term political warfare, uh, s traces back to Kennan's uh, Cold War definition. And that, I think, is a broad but very appropriate um, definition. What's different now than then, of course, was that focus was very much on state actors. And the critical difference, uh, I think, that you've adopted here is to apply gray zone to non-state actors as well. I think it's very important to note that this, uh, these tactics are in fact applied uh, by a wide range of actors. Now, uh, there are elements that a state, a fully fledged state can apply that a non-state actor doesn't. Um, but I think it's appropriate and important to look at this phenomenon and it is I would say the objectives really of, of the aggressor, if you will, is to extend their influence and weaken uh, or destabilize or subvert their target. And that weakening often occurs from within, as I think you uh, all very uh, e uh, effectively pointed out. Uh, but at the bottom, I think we need to sort of, it's a contest, it's a competition, but I'll start and end with this main point. It is a form of warfare. Uh, there's actually a doctrinal term that DOD uses, irregular warfare. Uh, so without getting into the word soup, uh, I think it is very important 
for uh, the U.S. To, to start grappling with this as a form of warfare, which I think will galvanize the necessary actions that have not yet been taken. So to uh, provide you a brief overview of our study, we did um, frame uh, and bound the concept. We had a first chapter looking at the Cold War history and the practices uh, that the U.S. Uh, undertook at that time. And I'll mention briefly a few examples from that history. We then uh, conducted deep case studies, uh, Russia, Iran, uh, and the Islamic State. We also examined some other uh, practices that are being used actually in the private sector, which might approximate a form of political warfare. The, um, the uh, case studies were uh, uh, done in a great, very great depth and using the, the DIME, the Diplomatic Informational Military and Economic Construct, or DIME fill. So we were looking across the spectrum of activities in each case. We also looked for what passed for a theory or a strategy or the doctrinal basis of that actor uh, to, to um, try to probe the logic but behind these disparate activities. Because that is the, one of the difficult things about this uh, form of warfare, is it's very subtle, it's very multifaceted, uh, it's very hard to track and say all of these different data points over time add up to a concerted campaign. And then the final uh, chapters of our uh, work uh, look at, we have a particular one on influence and strategic communications. And again, I think we'd all agree that the informational space is different uh, than in the, in the past, in the Cold War period. And it's, it was important then, but now it's extremely uh, important uh, given the tools at the disposal uh, of the actors. Um, so briefly on the uh, history, I would point to our own history that um, the Reagan doctrine included a very deliberate emphasis on using proxies or freedom fighters as uh, Reagan, uh, the Reagan administration, Reagan administration dubbed them. And whether you think these specific cases were successful or not, I'll just mention them without going into great detail. Of course, the uh, campaign against the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan using uh, the Northern uh, Alliance and the Mujahideen that got, uh, was successful in ejecting the Soviet Union. Uh, the uh, Angola and Nicaraguan Contras were the other uh, two uh, elements of that. Also, I think it's very important to look at the solidarity experience in Poland. And I think the US was extremely effective there in uh, an array of support to that civilian movement. And you'll see in my next example, these, uh, these are themes about, I think, where, where we can gain the most traction. Of course, in the Cold War, I will note, we had an institution called USIA, the US information agency. We had very robust and connected U.S. agency uh, for international development and State Department. So, so those were fully uh, engaged partners, lead elements of our government. And they were really focused in many cases on the communication and support to, to uh, partners around the world. The one case I want to highlight here, and I went, I spent a good bit of time in the Baltics and a good bit of time, particularly in Estonia. Uh, they, of course, were uh, subject to a massive denial of service attack by Russia in 2007 around this incident called the Bronze Soldier Incident. Without going into great uh, detail, the Estonian um, government and society, I think, represents the model type of response. They have, um, they have a top to bottom approach. The national policy level has a written plan, has a strategy. They have connected their Ministry of Interior and Defense. They have civilian groups, including the Estonian Defense League uh, and other civil society groups. They all understand their part in the plan. They exercise it. They, they have what I consider the premier whole of government and whole of society uh, approach to combating Russian interference. They're also the home of the NATO uh, Cyber Center of Excellence uh, in, and founded there in part because of their early uh, experience uh, being attacked by Russia, but also because they uh, are a very cyber 
connected um, society and government. Virtually everything they do is online, so it's imperative to them that they um, uh, harden uh, their defenses. They also put out, very interestingly, an annual report, a very detailed annual report of all of these activities across this dime fill spectrum. It's posted online. It's a public uh, exposure of the tactics that they are being uh, subjected to, and it accomplishes uh, a number of um, um, objectives with that uh, detailed reporting and uh, public exposure. I would characterize their approach overall as one of increasing their resilience and preparing to resist. The resistance concept is, I think, the most uh, uh, um, viable concept uh, for framing the responses. We also have in the in US military doctrine unconventional warfare, which is really the doctrine of support to proxies and resistance movements. Um, but I think that, that the key thought that animates Estonians is they are not preparing to uh, confront conventional war. They are not preparing to eject uh, Soviet armored formations. They understand they're already at war. Uh, and they're in it now and they're dealing with it now. And I think that this is not, while I believe the US government is not really focused on this as a form of warfare, I would cite the Secretary of Defense, um, uh, General Mattis, as ca characterizing the US as in an era of permanent skirmishing. And I think that's a nice uh, phrase that really represents this, this uh, sort of uh, challenge going on around the world by different countries. Where we're focused now, because the US government doesn't have a systematic way of tracking uh, the forms of uh, probes that other countries, as well as the US, are under, is, is an updated version of an indicators and warning model so that we understand what's happening at these early phases so that the appropriate proactive responses uh, can be met. Uh, so I just would end with what we found were the main attributes across our case studies of this uh, form of warfare today. As we noted, it is also non-state actors today. They can pr uh, uh, conduct uh, warfare of this type with unprecedented ability. And in the case of the Islamic State, which I spent uh, much of the last four years studying, they were a quasi-state. Uh, terrorist group that is going to set the playbook for every future uh, non-state actor. They developed extremely f effective tactics across the spectrum, not just in their active and effective social use of social media, encrypted apps, and so forth. Uh, the, the all elements of national power piece, everybody has focused on that. This is, and this is very, very important because our tendency is to default to the military uh, elements. The, by the time the military gets involved, unless except in a very covert way or um, the non-kinetic uses of the military, the game is, is likely to be over. Heavy, heavy reliance on unattributed uh, means and forces. So this is why there's a heavy burden on the intelligence community and exposure and linkage of these uh, layers, uh, six degrees of separation the information arena, critical battleground, and, and success is really determined by perception here, and I think we need to work with that concept much more. And, and again, information warfare isn't so much about persuading, but obfuscating, creating sufficient confusion. Um, our uh, RAND president has put out a book that I think is terrific called Truth Decay. There are a lot of other works out about this. But when people don't understand what's true and what's false anymore, again, the enemy is, is close to winning. Uh, economic leverage and coercion, preferred tools. I, would, I think that China is really the premier example here. Um, and, and we, uh, Robert Blackwell's written a great book about that. Uh, I think we need to be much more alert to that. And then uh, the political warfare or gray zone tactics really succeed when they find a seam. They can enter into a society through, as in, in the case of the Baltics, shared ethnic uh, bonds uh, to some degree in the Middle East through religious bonds. Internal seams is really the theme, though. They get in and they exploit the divisions in a society uh, and, and can weaken in that fashion. And then finally, it's not an either or situation. It extends the spectrum of warfare, doesn't replace traditional conflict. So I don't want to be mistaken for 
uh, discarding the, that we still have conventional and thermonuclear war to worry about, uh, but because this is the most cost-effective way to conduct warfare, it is the major default for most of the adversaries in the world today. Thank you very much. Really phenomenal insights. I'm just going to ask one or two questions and then we'll go to the audience. So please um, start thinking about what you want to ask. Um, one theme that came across, and there are a number, but one theme that strikes me that comes across is the role of civil society. And that could be our civil society. It could be a, a, a partner or ally country. Um, and I think, Jamie, if we start with you, you, you spoke directly to some of the things that can be done to strengthen civil society, tr sort of transparency and truth telling uh, is a piece of that. Um, but I, I'd love for all of you to expand, because it, it came up in each of your comments on things we, we might think about uh, from past activity that we have done or where we failed that um, ought to guide us in terms of engaging American society or again in, in allied and partner countries, their societies, and how to be resilient and uh, prevent these attacks from being successful. Yeah, in the, in the US context, it's, it's difficult because what we've noticed when we if you look at various European national experiences, some of the countries that have been the most resilient are because of things like media culture, which obviously it's hard to change the US media culture at this point. Uh, more and more Americans are getting their news and information from social media. It's just a fact. Uh, we're not going to recreate a vibrant scene of local newspapers, for instance. Um, if you look at Germany in particular, where we actually have a, another uh, Twitter dashboard that follows some of uh, similar Russian attempts on, on German social media, it doesn't have as much of an impact, uh, partly because Twitter is not used as much. And uh, most Germans still get their news and information from uh, public radio or TV or newspapers. Um, so some of those things are hard in a, in a vibrant democracy like America to, to go back to a, a previous era. Um, but what is required, I think, is just more education and understanding. And some of that gets into the broader question of the health of our democracy. Because obviously, if we had no problems in America and there were no divisions and uh, no racial issues or uh, debates about immigration, then there wouldn't be these seams that uh, the Russians or another foreign actor could try to exploit. Um, so again, we're never going to solve all those problems. But the more that we can move towards a, a situation where debate can be civil, uh, where our more Americans have trust in our institutions, uh, I think it's going to be harder for people to, uh, to take advantage of, of us. Um, one thing, though, that a number of the, my colleagues raised that I think relates to this I also think we need a national conversation at some point, certainly in, in the policy community within government, about how we respond and use political warfare and what the limits are of, of where we're willing to go and where we're not willing to go. I've been troubled in particular just in the last year or two seeing some congressional testimony from uh, DOD officials uh, about, oh, well, these may be tactics that we're able to use on the battlefield. Um, I think that. We can't lose sight of what our strengths are, and our strengths at the end of the day are that uh, we're a society that is based upon truth. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as was noted, the Russian effort is one to basically decay truth and raise questions about whether there is any uh, valid truth. Uh, and so I think we need to be very careful about responding in kind, mm -hmm. uh, to whether it's to Russia or whether it's to a terrorist group even. I think. Uh, if we head in that direction, we're just going to exacerbate the problem within our own societies and cause more and more Americans to question uh, their own government and their own institutions. And so I think it's a very fine line that, that we need to walk. The difference between responding to disinformation with disinformation yes. and responding to disinformation with information. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's a, it's a challenging question in the Middle East context, how to support civil society, especially in the context of this gray zone conflict. Um, and I, I don't frankly think it's something we have done well over the years. Um, in societies that are highly sort of factionalized or fractured, I, I think you, you run into a couple of sort of minefields. One is, um, you know, you don't want to respond to proxy uh, conflict with proxy conflict of your own. And this kind of goes to what Jamie was talking about. There was, for example, in the early 1980s in Lebanon, a perception that you know, when the U.S. was supporting the Lebanese armed forces, we were sort of just taking a side in the Lebanese um, civil war. Um, and that almost, um, it, the risk there is that you almost legitimize the tactics of the other side by employing those tactics yourself. Um, so, so you have to be careful of that, and you could expand that to any number of theaters around the Middle East. 
the, the other problem that we've encountered is that, well, some of the forces which um, are best organized um, and might be opposed to a state like Iran are also opposed to us. Uh, and so it's not a simple two-sided conflict on which you can kind of just support the other side, as it were, um, uh, in the way that we kind of romantically remember the Cold War, right? I'm not sure it was true then either. Um, but it certainly isn't true in the Middle East, um, and that we've run into a lot of problems with that, and that's caused us in many cases to pull back um, from any kind of support to civil society. Um, I, I think that there are a couple things you can do. One is to focus really on institutions. Um, I, I do think that societies with strong institutions are less vulnerable, although um, it's A, very hard, and B, I don't think it's a um, silver bullet at the same time, because one thing that you know, some of these gray zone actors are good at is also co-opting institutions and, and using those for their own benefit. Um, second, I do think that it's probably most important and maybe most effective to um, speak out for civil society, defend civil society um, in allied states. Um, you know, so for example, in a, a place uh, like Saudi Arabia or Bahrain where you have a Shia um, population, um, I do think that we can play an important role because we're allies to those states in um, basically speaking up for those um, uh, persecuted, I mm -hmm. keep, we'll keep wanting to say minorities, they're not always minorities, um, those persecuted parts of the population, um, ensuring that there is a sort of uh, spotlight shined on that issue um, so that those don't become vectors for the influence of a state like Iran or um, in other contexts, Russia, China, and so forth. Okay. Kelly. Um, so I'm going to uh, praise CSIS uh, right now for the work that it has been doing on the transparency front as it relates to what's happening in the South China Sea. I think that's hugely important and it's an example of what civil society can do to really shine a line on what's happening. Uh, so I do think information and transparency is kind of the first thing that the civil, civil society can offer in the context of gray zone. Um, you know, in the case of South China Sea, we did some work with you know, environmental groups, because clearly, you know, this uh, land, this reclamation going on in the South China Sea has, was having really devastating effects uh, on the fisheries and the reefs and all of that. And so that was actually uh, a pretty palpable tool, because most of the local populations in the Philippines and Vietnam and elsewhere really care about fisheries and, sure. and reefs um, and really don't want to see what the Chinese are doing, which is basically undermining the environmental aspects uh, in the region. Um, and. That, I'll raise on the economic front, you know, to get to the economic coercion piece, you know, China's right now implementing Belt Road Initiative, as we all know. Um, I think one really important thing that could be done is exposing Chinese investments and shining transparency on those investments so that, you know, a country X knows what China's doing in country Y, right? So people have a full lens on, on what the plan is and they can compare you know, whether the Chinese have followed through on an infrastructure investment appropriately or not. So I think some of that sharing, now that's probably going to be mostly done through governments, but I certainly think civil society has a, a role to play in that space. I don't want to overemphasize transparency because I don't think, you know, China is going to, while this, it may suffer reputational costs for a lot of this, it's going to pursue its aims for its national interest. So I think we should be careful about overweighting mm -hmm. the effect of transparency, but I do think it's an important component of the strategy. Um, not necessarily because it will stop the Chinese in their tracks, but because it will show others what's happening and potentially marshal them to action. Um, and to the institutional point, which came up uh, earlier, you know, again, I think the challenge for Asia is it lacks a lot of institutions. There's not, there's not a NATO alliance. Um, there's ASEAN, which is, of course, a consensus organization, relatively weak, as we all know. Um, so I think that is a real uh, problem in the context of China and, and how we can push back multilaterally against them uh, and what they're doing in, in these gray zone areas. So I think that's, that's a place, I think, of weakness uh, in the Asia context. Great. Linda. Um, so I think that while uh, the Cold War has some instructive lessons, it's important to note that we move beyond uh, that in some respects, the most prominent example being the ban on political assassinations. Uh, there are tactics used in the past that clearly are not acceptable uh, today, but I think there is, uh, is good value in looking back uh, at some of those lessons. Where we wound up with our final chapter was that the response has got to be grounded in 
an overarching uh, stand, message, strategy. And this is very much, I think, what Mike was saying. It's a defense of and a promotion of a rules-based international order, which is the precise thing that is under attack. It's a willingness to enunciate not only US interests, but US <coughs> values. Because if you don't have a positive agenda, you are then just playing uh, the countering uh, game. And I think that is uh, vital. Um, I think that we, we also, and this is very debatable, but I will make the case for it. Uh, we nominated state as the logical lead entity for this uh, effort, rather than housing something in the White House, in the NSC, which in my view should be a coordinating uh, body. And the, the directive obviously has to come from the White House, but if you look at the form of warfare, it's not military, it's the D, I, and E. And traditionally this has been, and, and it is still considered that state is the lead agency uh, for foreign policy in the world. And when you get right down to it, this is effective statecraft. This is what we're talking about. Uh, and it would also be, I think, imperative for state to take on this operational and indeed expeditionary role. We have a very crippled and degraded State Department right now, so a first step would be to rebuild it, to understand the organizational requirements for it to both formulate the concept and then lead the coordination across all of the relevant agencies. And I think that we have, um, you know, we tend to militarize many efforts within the government simply because there's manpower resources and a lot of talented planners in that entity. Um, and I think this is, we have to really uh, be wary that we may be using the hammer when we really need to build other things in the toolkit. Uh, I'll mention two quick things that I know you'll have in the next panel, the Global Engagement Center and that effort, which expanded from the effort to counter the Islamic State's uh, massive propaganda rec recruitment and operational uh, planning machine that was all happening on, in the virtual space uh, to the Russia, countering the Russian influence. Uh, but it has to be embraced by state. It needs to be connected to DOD and the rest of government, but it can't be overwhelmed uh, by uh, DOD. And I think there's a lot of work to be done there. The example I will take from abroad, and also knowing you're going to have, I think, the UK on your next panel, very interesting experiment. We, we talked to and went out to see the 77th Brigade, uh, which, was, which embraced the term political warfare, which has uh, military personnel in it carefully selected, but also, very critically, a flexible use of their reservist hiring authorities to go out and get technical expertise, um, also uh, social and political expertise that didn't reside in the military and really build kind of a whole of government uh, cell there. And I think that's a very worthwhile experiment to, uh, to look at and to maybe look at those uh, similar creative uses. They also send people out into industry. Uh, and I think this, this is a really um, useful model for us to look at. Great. OK, we have about 10 minutes for questions, and then we'll have a 10-minute break before the second panel. What I'm going to do is gather several questions so we can get the most conversation going. So if you can raise your hand. When I call on you, um, give your name and your affiliation and stand up. One question, please, um, and not a statement. So we have one right there in the back. Good morning. I'm Yuri Raitrola from the Finnish National Defense University. I'm a military professor. Thank you for the excellent discussion here. I have two questions. First of all, uh, we heard a lot about warfare. Information warfare was mentioned, uh, cyber warfare, hybrid warfare, and, and uh, political warfare. So I would argue that we are rather uh, wealthy, rather secure today. So if we use all of these terms warfare all the time today, uh, how much analytical utility is there when st things start going really bad uh, po potentially in the future? So if we put political rhetorics aside, is there really that much analytical utility to see everything through the lenses of warfare today? And the second question would be concerning information arena and fake news. Uh, could you mention some examples about how we have all been fooled by, for example, Russia's fake news that our, our citizens and our strategic decision makers have been changing their own beliefs or our national narratives about, uh, about some uh, important uh, fact of, of international security, because I do think that we quite often see Russia being very, very uh, good in, in, in creating fake news, but are they really that effective? Thank you. 
Very good. Just a reminder, one question and questions only, so we'll come right over here. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Andrea Rotte. I'm a research fellow with the German Marshall Fund and ASEGS, and I'm from Germany doing research on security and defense policy. So thank you very much for the discussion. Um, in Germany, we are, of course, also focus on resilience. Um, and thank you for highlighting our media culture. I wasn't aware of that. Um, but the thing is, we have very slow progress in this regard. And I think one of the main problems in Germany is how to frame the political communication and how to engage with our own civil society. So I'm sure you're aware of that. We tried, um, or Thomas de Musier, the formal um, former Federal Minister of Affairs, he tried to engage civil society by alerting or by raising awareness for food security, and this were, it caused a huge and drastic reaction within German society um, that he would be fear-mongering, or also when it comes to fake news. Um, so in Germany, the main question is how to really engage with civil society, how to prepare or how to raise awareness and um, civil preparedness for this causes. So I'd be interested on any insights with that. Okay, and one more question. Let's see, we've got one right here. Uh, good morning, Phil Pornell from the Long Term Strategy Group. Uh, Mr. Fly, you discussed earlier that one of the things we need to work on is uh, deterrence in response to uh, political warfare and information campaigns. Can you be more specific of what you actually mean by deterrence what would be the action that impo either imposes a cost um, or um, ceases the activities? Great. And actually, why don't we start? If uh, we'll go down, pick any of the questions you'd like to respond to, and I'll try to get a second round in if we can. Yes. Well, I, I'd like to suggest that I think we have an immediate task with regard to the fake news phenomenon to um, really. Uh, and I know there are efforts already underway, so I'd just like to highlight this. Uh, I call it the caveat emptor approach. You know, people have their own news feeds, they've got their social media, they're probably not aware, they're self-selecting to reinforce their biases. So I think some kind of public education campaign to actually make each citizen more responsible for their own education and more savvy about what they're being fed. Uh, because very few people are going to go off social media, but they have to understand where their, where their uh, deficits are, and where their knowledge gap is, and to really undertake their own forensics. Uh, so that would be my main comment. Great. Kelly, you have anything you want to add? No, I guess on the, the question about deterrence in response to information warfare, I, Jamie will know much more than I in this space, but I think, again, I think Going back to some of the examples I laid out, I think early specific communication at the highest political level is important. And the second most important thing is follow through on a broad response um, to that action. I think if you lead entirely with a military response, you're gonna put yourself in a, in a very constrained box. It's gotta be a much broader US government response and it has to be communicated very clearly and specifically to whoever is is engaging in that in that context. So that's. But Jamie will be much more um, have much more ideas on that space. Okay, Mike. Um, I, I will say on the, the warfare question, I, I tend to share the sentiment. I'm not sure that it's useful to consider everything warfare, um, and I do worry that we we uh, too hand too much responsibility to DoD. I mean, it. I don't totally agree with um, Linda's notion that our first impulse is military. Often, I think we hesitate to use military action even when it would be appropriate to consider military action. Um, instead, I think our default often is sanctions or, or um, a meeting or something like that. But oftentimes we, we give even the non-military tasks to the military to do. We, we sort of diplomatize the military uh, in many cases. And I think there's, I mean, the, to me, it's a, a problem with a kind of straightforward solution that seems to elude us, which is we really need to strengthen our diplomatic um, and other non-military tools. I mean, you know, the State Department um, needs to be strengthened and, and oftentimes that's sort of put, uh, characterized as well, it needs more money. I actually don't think that that's the key thing. I think we actually need to take a look at our diplomacy and ask how does it need to be updated for the 21st century because it really hasn't been updated in a very long time. Um, but I think the problem you identify is right. I'll, I'll just say on the, the fake news phenomenon and, and this, this question of um, combating it, 
fake news is uh, an old phenomenon in the Middle East. Um, <laughs> it's just most of it's not in English, and so we haven't paid attention, right? Um, but you know, if you look at the Middle East, most Middle Easterners, not most, a, a, a very high um, percentage, a disturbingly high percentage, for example, think the United States created ISIS. Um, and it's no mistake that this is one of Iran's constant routine messages um, that is unfortunately sometimes picked up by people here in the United States. Um, and people believe it. Um, you know, so there are these kind of you know, misleading narratives. Um, you know, Iran had this uh, narrative about an anti-nuclear fatwa, which became very powerful during the nuclear negotiations, for example. It doesn't exist, but it still has taken on a life of its own. Um, I, I think that the biggest problem here is we simply lack norms uh, in this realm. You know, we have norms about in the physical world, you know, uh, when states shouldn't seize territory from other states, although we've kind of ignored Russia having done that um, in the recent years. Um, we have norms in the economic world, even about sort of governments, what kind of economic activity in our countries is permissible or okay for other governments to engage in. I, I think we really lack norms in this more digital um, world which we now operate in. You know, what is okay for governments to do on the internet in our country? Um, I don't think we even have agreement on that, and that to me seems like a prerequisite for taking action. Good, Jamie. On deterrence, I'm um, just picking up where Mike and Kelly left off. Um, I mean, I think Kelly hit the, the key points in responding to specific use of these tools. We have a broader problem with Russia. I mean, we lost our deterrent uh, balance with Russia a long time ago, well before the Russians started to use these sorts of tactics within our political system. That's part of the problem. We should never let uh, our, our relationship with um, competitors like Russia get to that point where after the invasion of Georgia, we're unprepared when Crimea is invaded and annexed or the Donbass is invaded. Uh, so things begin to fell, fall apart um, under multiple administrations, I think. On that front, I worry about a similar dynamic with China if we don't start to push back now on some of these measures that we're seeing. So it starts with that. When we do see red lines being crossed and direct interference in American politics, that's when you need uh, clear messaging, as has been outlined. You need a, a broad effort in terms of sanctions uh, showing that this will not be accepted. And what I worry about in the current context is uh, our society is tearing itself apart, debating whether the interference even happened. So we're, if, you're sitting, if you're Vladimir Putin sitting in the Kremlin, do you think you're deterred from doing anything similar? Congress has passed no piece of legislation uh, 18 months after the election. We're about to go into the midterms. Uh, nothing is different. Uh, yes, some additional money for states, uh, but if they wanted to take the next step and start actually changing voter rolls or trying to play with mo voter voting machines, which we know they started to probe last time, uh, there's been very uh, few barriers thrown up to those sorts of things. So I don't think we're anywhere close to the, the deterrent relationship we need, uh, at least in the Russian case. We have more time, hopefully, to develop uh, a better deterrent posture vis-a-vis -vis China and I hope we take advantage of it. Um, how to engage citizens. One, we've been struggling with this a lot in the question of where, who within the US government should be the lead on this. I think certainly for most of these gray zone tactics overseas, clearly the State Department should be in the lead. For the things I outlined here today though, we're, we're not clear that the State Department can play much of a role. I mean, these, this is inherently an American political conversation. Uh, the Global Engagement Center cannot do messaging to Americans as far as I know. Uh, unfortunately, it falls into a counterintelligence space, and the reality is our law enforcement agencies that uh, are responsible for that are already overburdened and understaffed. Um, so we think that there does need to be a coordinated effort out of the White House on this sort of messaging, but part of it is so many Americans distrust the government right now, and the president has played into this with the way he's messaged about this issue. So many Americans say, well, the president says Russia wasn't interfering, so who do you believe? Uh, should I actually be concerned about this or not? So. We need to get our messaging right. We need a, a responsible, high-level individual, I think, within uh, the White House who is dealing with this threat, threat and can coordinate the response because it, it relates to so many different law enforcement intelligence agencies, State Department, and DOD. And then finally, on the impact, this has been debated in both the US context. There's a debate in the UK about Brexit and whether there was any impact. Um, we've seen similar experiences in Central and Eastern Europe. The thing for me at the end of the day, we can never prove that a certain piece of disinformation changed X number of voters' minds. Um, but there are already, now that we've seen more of the Internet Research Agency ads, there are specific examples that have been proven where Americans read something online and they took physical action in response. One case in particular, the Senate Intelligence 
committee highlighted was a, a dueling rallies on the same day at the same time in Houston, Texas, where people assembled thinking that they were there, one behind a group called Texas Secessionists, another a group of uh, supposedly American Muslims. These were internet research agency created groups manned entirely by people sitting in a foreign country and they led to hundreds of Americans turning out in the street for dueling protests. Now, the Russians hoped to actually provoke violence on that day, and luckily it didn't happen because the police were there and kept the two sides apart. But that is an example of people doing something in response to something they just saw on the internet that was created uh, by a foreign actor with a malign intent. The Mueller indictment documented multiple other instances of similar rallies being organized in support of uh, then-candidate Trump in swing states. And again, there were no actual Americans involved in creating the idea that we should all assemble in this place at this time, but real Americans did show up uh, in response. And obviously, they may have gotten together anyways in some other form if they were a Trump supporter, which is fine, it's their right. Uh, but these are just the leading edge, I think, of several examples we've seen. Uh, and I think uh, there's probably many more as we learn more about the actual tactics that were used. Um, and that's the, the truly troubling thing about uh, these efforts. Well, the good news is you have first break, but then you have a full panel where you can dig back into these issues led by my extremely capable colleague, Heather Connolly. So please join me in a round of applause for this panel, and we will take a five-minute break. That's really great. Thank you.
Well, good morning and welcome back to part two of our conversation on gray zone challenges, what works. Uh, my name is Heather Conley. I am Kath Hicks' partner in crime uh, in, this, uh, in this discussion. Um, and I am absolutely delighted that we truly have a transatlantic panel to talk about those gray zone challenges. Of course, we can talk about them more widely, but because I direct our Europe program, I'm only interested in one thing, and I'm interested in how these gray zone tactics work in Europe, and particularly on the Russia challenge. Let me just briefly introduce our four brilliant panelists, and then I'm going to get out of their way and let them share some thoughts with you. We'll do some Q&A, and we'll welcome you into that conversation as well. So to my immediate left, let me uh, welcome uh, Mr. Michael Tatum, uh, Deputy Head of Mission at the British Embassy here in Washington, a position he assumed in January of this year. Prior to uh, coming to Washington, Michael has served as the Director for, Cent for Eastern Europe and Central Asia in the uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office. He has been a political, the political coordinator at the British Mission at the United Nations. He has been British Ambassador to Bosnia, head of the Western Balkans Group, and uh, Deputy Chief of Mission uh, at the British Embassy in Prague. So uh, he's seasoned in both Western Balkans, Central Europe, and we're hoping that he will share some of his insights on the British government response and reaction to the Skripal poisoning. Um, after Michael, we'll turn to Dr. Hannah Smith, the Director of Strategic Planning and Responses at the European Center of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats, uh, a center that is located in Helsinki, Finland. Prior to this position, Dr. Smith has worked at the University of Helsinki in a variety of, of key research positions looking at Russia uh, uh, and specializing certainly in uh, Eurasia international organizations, and we're delighted that Dr. Smith can be with us. Moving right along, we have uh, Mr. Daniel Kimmich, the Acting Special Envoy and Coordinator of the Global Engagement Center at the Department of State. We talked a bit about the Global Engagement Center in our first discussion. Now we have the acting uh, leader who's going to help us understand exactly what the Global Engagement Center is up to. Daniel uh, started this position in January of last year. Um, and prior to this has served in a number of positions at the Department of State Office of Policy Planning and Principal Deputy Coordinator uh, for uh, Counterterrorism Communications. So Daniel, we're, we're delighted that you could take time out of your busy schedule to, uh, to join us from the State Department. And then finally, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Ambassador Phil Rieger, civilian deputy to the commander of the US uh, European Command to General Scaparotti. Um, Phil is a great friend and colleague, uh, and we're, we're glad he could, he was traveling to accompany General Scaparotti, so we grabbed him and made him stay an extra day with us. Uh, Phil assumed his position with uh, General Scaparotti in November of 2017, has served in a variety uh, of posts as a foreign service officer, most recently Consul General in Milan. He served as Deputy <coughs> Assistant Secretary of State in the European and Eurasian Bureau from 2011 to 2013, focusing on the Western Balkans. He was the former U.S. Ambassador uh, to uh, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, served in Iraq, served in Budapest, so lots and lots of experience. Also hoping to pick your brain on the Western Balkans, perhaps, if that's uh, where we could look at Russian um, hybrid tactics. So I have to say, just to confuse you all, we've used so many terms today. We gray zone, hybrid, asymmetrical warfare, irregular warfare. I use the Russian doctrinal. I call it new generation warfare. Warfare because we are at war. New because it use, uses social media tools that are quite new. And it's generational because it is designed to generationally divide us very deeply. So that's my new term. So just to throw one out to confuse you all. But uh, Michael, uh, the UK has been at the eye of the storm of a lot of Russian malign activities and we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts on that. Welcome. Thank you very much. So here, here are my thoughts on that. My first thought is thank you very much um, to CSIS for convening this very timely uh, discussion because the, whatever you call it, the gray zone uh, or whatever, it's, it's a big preoccupation uh, for governments uh, and it needs to be. We're living in a more complex world the playbook of aggressive behavior and how to respond to it is changing. 
technology and global connectivity are unleashing whole new areas of space to, uh, to, to play in. Heather, you, you, you sort of had a little discussion there about terminology. I use much more kind of um, uh, mundane, prosaic terms. And, and conceptually, I, I divide it up to, to what I call the familiar and the unfamiliar. In the familiar space, it feels to me as though there is a kind of playbook um, which exists and which we know how to use and which we use uh, reasonably uh, effectively. So on the military side, the reinvigorated deterrence that we've seen uh, develop through successive uh, NATO summits, uh, the sanctions that the EU and the US uh, have applied uh, against, uh, against Russia. Um, in Europe, the increased focus on energy security uh, and diversification. Um, the way in which we have uh, developed programs of support um, to those countries who are uh, particularly exposed to, uh, to, to Russian uh, aggressive behavior uh, and destabilization. That, I think, is, is what I mentally categorize as, as the familiar, um, where the playbook exists, and I think there's a, a sort of respectable story to tell in terms of what has been uh, done. The unfamiliar is exactly what you were describing, the asymmetric, the, the hybrid, the cyber, uh, and so on. Um, and what should we be doing about that? Um, I offer these thoughts with a degree of uh, humility, because I think we don't yet know uh, all the answers. These are new challenges, um, and in some, way, in some instances, we are finding our way uh, in terms of how, how to deal with them. But let me offer these thoughts. I think the first point, it's a very obvious point, uh, but it's about awareness. Um, it's about awareness of the risks um, and ending a kind of mindset of, of either denial or complacency. In the three years that I spent as, uh, in, in, in London as director for Eastern Europe and Central Asia, it felt to me as though in, in a lot of European countries, in, in the dialogue I had with them, you could sort of sense a journey, uh, and which started from the kind of, yes, yes, this is all going on, but look, we're, we're free societies, we have freedom of speech, freedom of media. Uh, those principles are strong enough uh, just to kind of uh, dispel uh, any, any, any challenges or any menace uh, that we might face. I think now there is a much greater awareness uh, of the vulnerabilities um, within our systems, an awareness that has, has, uh, we've, we've gotten to through painful uh, experience uh, in many cases. So I think we need to recognize that our adversaries are developing uh, offensive capacity, which in some cases has exceeded uh, our defensive capacity, and, and recognize the strategic imperative of closing uh, that gap. The second thing that I would say is, uh, is attribution. This feels to me a little bit like, like low-hanging fruit. When, when somebody does something bad to us, we should be calling them out uh, on it. Um, that kind of behavior thrives if the, uh, if the party carrying it out feels that they can sort of get away with it, or if they can do it and there'll be an element of suspicion but still, uh, still lingering uh, doubt. So I think taking a very strong approach and always looking to uh, attribute whenever you possibly can uh, is, uh, is important. And it, it, that sounds like an obvious point, but I was quite struck again when, when in, in, in my last job when I was talking to representatives of other governments and it looked like they would you know, been uh, on the receiving end of some kind of grey zone tactic. Um, and we would say, you know, go public. We're, we'll come in and support. There'd be a sort of, well, you know, we're not sure if we want to. There's a slight sort of embarrassment factor. Do you want to expose the fact that there was a vulnerability um, in, your, uh, in your defenses? Um, the third thing I would say um, is we should be looking for collective uh, response uh, in, uh, in, in this sort of gray zone uh, space. Um, you know, in the military space, it's very clear. We have Article 5 um, within uh, NATO, uh, and an attack upon one ally uh, triggers uh, a collective um, response. Um, we should be looking for a similar mindset uh, to exist in, uh, in, in the sort of gray zone space. Um, we want countries to know that if they take on one country, they can't just pick on that country. Um, they will be taking on a whole community uh, of like-minded countries um, who share uh, the same values. 
you were asking me to talk about uh, Skripal uh, and, and, and the Salisbury uh, attack. And, and that, I think, for me, was a, a very important moment for, for several reasons. One is that I think it was um, uh, a very uh, a compelling example of exactly that pattern of emboldened Russian behavior uh, in, 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 in the gray zone. So I think it illustrated uh, that problem uh, very clearly. I think it was also an important moment because there was such a strong collective Western reaction to the uh, attack. The response did not just come um, from the UK, it came from over two dozen countries uh, and it came in the form of uh, over 12 dozen uh, expulsions. And I'm pretty sure uh, that that was a response which exceeded what uh, Russia would have costed in uh, when it started planning uh, the operation. And I think making, uh, making it clear that uh, an attack in the gray zone space on one country is an attack upon many um, is, is an important part of what our response needs to be. And linked to that, I think it's about keeping the spotlight uh, on this problem. It's about using the international fora uh, and mechanisms uh, that we have to, 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 to raise awareness, uh, to make those countries that are carrying these, these actions out feel under pressure, feel exposed. Um, I think that's what we've been trying to do in the OPCW space uh, following the, uh, the attack in Salisbury. Um, I think another aspect of this is about developing capacity um, and, uh, and ex expertise. Uh, in the UK, for example, we've established a national cyber uh, security center that has developed a national strategy uh, in the cyberspace. I think it's excellent that, that you know, the, the center like the one that Hannah is representing uh, exists to kind of develop and share uh, expertise uh, in, this, uh, in this area. Um, I think countering is important. I think this is particularly important in the uh, information, uh, disinformation space, developing the capacity um, so that we can quickly uh, rebut um, and uh, nail uh, egregious examples of, uh, of, of, of disinformation or lies that are being uh, disseminated, finding intelligent programs um, through which we can support independent uh, and uh, objective media, particularly in the Russian language space, where at the minute uh, either the Russian state or Russian state-controlled bodies uh, have a near monopoly of, uh, of Russian language uh, media uh, outlets. Um, and the final thing I would say, because I'm conscious I've kind of uh, come up against my, my, my time limit, is, is joined upness. Um, the countries that are operating aggressively in the gray zone space um, tend to be countries uh, that are very centralized, where all the levers converge um, in, uh, in one point. Um, the Western community, the EU, NATO, the multilateral organizations are, uh, are, are dispersed. Um, but we need to make our, uh, our decision making uh, as joined up uh, as possible. We need organizations like the EU and NATO uh, to be working together. Cyber has a military and a civilian uh, dimension. Uh, EU sanctions against Russia and reinvigorated deterrence through NATO uh, are, are policies from different organizations, but they need to be seen uh, within the same strategic framework. And there obviously needs to be uh, a degree of, of, of dialogue and coordination uh, between those, uh, those organizations. Um, I will stop there. Great, Michael. Thank you so much. Hannah, please. Thank you very much. Um, good morning for everybody, and thank you very much for CSIS and the Finnish uh, Foreign Ministry um, for organizing this uh, and inviting us to participate. Um, the European Center of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats has set, been set up last year. It was an EU initiative which was quite quickly in uh, 2016 endorsed by NATO, but we are not a NATO uh, organization, we are not an EU organization. We are for our uh, member states, but also for the EU and NATO uh, to use in their advantage. At the moment, we are 15 countries. 
uh, United States is uh, one uh, of, of the members, supports the center very well. EU CAM, uh, in fact, has been a, a great support and sending a, a secondment um, very shortly. Uh, I believe also summer. Um, this summer, yes, um, and uh, UK um, sometimes um, has been felt that it's, um, it's been one of the leading members in the way that the support from UK has been so strong. So we are very uh, thankful for those. One of the reasons why the centre was put in Helsinki uh, specifically is of course uh, Finnish experience relating to Russia long-term one. Um, it was mentioned in the previous panel, uh, the Estonian experience, but um, the Finn in me, um, I am fully Finnish, um, has to be saying that actually the Estonians adopted the Finnish model in 1990s. So that whole uh, issue is coming from Finland, and Finland had that already in 1960s. The whole of government, whole of society, a comprehensive security model, bringing different actors inside of the state together uh, to build uh, specifically resilience. And, and, and of course, this experience is one of the factors uh, behind uh, the center. Also, um, it's good to remember that Sweden and Norway, for example, has had also a quite strong historical experience, something that they call total defense, uh, Cold War time, but it has a similar ideas in the way that how to bring society uh, and, and state kind of closer to each other and also uh, the military. The civil military, of course, cooperation uh, is the thing that was a little bit perhaps uh, could be argued forgotten when Cold War was over, and that is a clear cut that we need to uh, be able to uh, bring that back. In Europe, uh, Russia, of course, uh, figures quite strongly uh, when we're talking about uh, hostile influencing, um, but also in many other ways. What we do in our center is not only looking at Russia, but also a much wider picture to try to give the tools to our member states, um, as well as to EU and NATO, to counter, in fact, uh, all kind of security threats relating to hybrid threats, gray zone, uh, new generation, whatever you want to call that phenomenon. So the interesting thing relating to the future aspect or current moment and what is uh, to come quite quickly is the fact that we are in a space between something old and something new. We know quite well the old, but we don't quite know what exactly the new uh, is. This has, of course, enabled weaker actors, and one could argue that uh, Russia, Iran as a state actors, possibly even uh, to a certain extent China, and as well as non-state actors, um, have been able to use this um, situation and this time and become proactive and using the opportunities this type of a change brings uh, um, in. And I would like to highlight the six points that uh, the Hybrid Co has actually identified which are crucial relating to uh, one we're thinking about how um, the future is shaped and what type of uh, capabilities and responses we would need to think about. One is the world order situation. Uh, first of all, that brings a competition over status and uh, resources. It also enables the fact that we start actually to negotiate about reality. What exactly is the world about today? And that, of course, puts the stronger actor, and in this case, the democratic states, on defense. It is also very difficult in this kind of situation, the democratic states, to identify the enemy. And of course, if you do not have a clear-cut enemy, it is difficult to think about the responses. Then the technological revolution, which was mentioned, has given very many new capabilities of influencing. It has also changed fundamentally several other um, um, kind of spaces. One of them is the media landscape. So it's not only kind of the fake news, but actually the whole kind of media space, the way how news are delivered, how they are produced, how they are introduced in the way that uh, you might have in a Twitter a news which is one sentence. And you need to know the context, uh, the, the reasons, 
their analysis out of that one sentence. This is rather challenging. And of course, that leaves a lot of space then for interpretation, perceptions, etc., to take a hold of. Then we have the network-based action. In the 1990s, uh, globalization, of course, was seen as one of those uh, positive aspects that brings all the conflicts to the end. Today, we see that, in fact, there is a dark side of globalization. And this uh, globalization with its networks actually amplifies any hostile influence. So therefore, also a weaker actor becomes stronger. Then we have, uh, in the fifth point, the generational change. We have now, uh, in the Western countries, a lot of youth that does not remember uh, the Cold War, has not a personal experience relating to that necessarily at all. This applies, in fact, also to other countries, not only to the Western countries. This creates, of course, a fully different type uh, of a situation when you argue about the leadership or trust to the institutions or trying to argue that, you know, this was a challenge before, we need to do like uh, before. And finally, uh, the sixth point is the changing character of war. Uh, today, of course, in the wars, there should not be anyone be killed not a soldier or a civilian for that matter. Even sometimes questionable, can you destroy facilities? This changes, of course, the war um, fully. And it was an interesting question uh, in the first panel relating to the information warfare, political warfare. This describes to us also the situation. War is not how it used to be, and yet there is a feeling that there is a war. This, of course, is a big, big challenge to think about also the responses. And finally, I want to finish with the saying that I think um, what we have lost in the Western countries is the belief to ourselves and to the strength for democracy. In fact, when we've been looking at it also in our center, uh, a lot of these uh, situation in different democratic countries uh, and then the hostile influence. The hostile influence uses our own confusion uh, a lot. So I would argue that at least one third, if not more, of the responses is to find again our own belief into our own system. Democracies are meant to be chaotic. They are meant to be renewing itself. They are meant to be doubting themselves. This is actually the thing that totalitarian systems and authoritarian systems, Russia included, um, have actually a difficulty sometimes because they have a certain lifespan and then when they need to be appearing to change, even if nothing changes, this actually weakens them uh, every time. And this, of, of course, is felt quite a lot, uh, both in Russia and China, I would say, um, today. So in that way, to actually uh, believe that the system we have know that it is actually very attractive and because it's so attractive, it is also a challenge for authoritarian and totalitarian states. And this is what we need to keep in mind. Thank you. Oh, that was great. Thank you so much. Daniel. Thank you. Um, well, let me start by thanking uh, the organizers for providing this uh, marvelous venue to discuss these important issues. And thank all of you for braving the early stages of uh, Washington's dreaded summer heat. Um, let me start with the most uh, general framing, and then I'll uh, uh, get a bit more specific and end with a few remarks on the uh, role of the Global Engagement Center. Um, I'd like to start by highlighting three global trends that I think are converging to really create a uh, almost what you could call a golden age or a new golden age for political warfare. These are all very familiar trends. They've been covered extensively. But I think that the way that they interact has had a, 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 a very unique and powerful effect. So the first is obviously a fundamental change in the technology for delivering and, and sharing uh, information. This is the communications technology that we all use. It's everything from computers to mobile phones to uh, the software and to the platforms of social media. But this technology has had a massive global effect. The second trend I would highlight is a return to a, a what was uh, uh, thought in the 1990s 
to be a bygone era of ideological competition. There is no longer much consensus uh, on the ideas that we saw in the 1990s, that the world is moving inexorably toward a technocratic, liberal, free market, democratic uh, utopia. There is considerable competition from the far end of the spectrum with uh, jihadist ideologies to resurgent uh, authoritarianism. So ideological competition is uh, back. And then lastly, geopolitical competition is back. This is no longer the bipolar era of the Cold War. It's no longer an era of any single country having uh, hegemony. It is a world of geopolitical competition. We saw this reflected most recently in our own um, uh, national security uh, strategy, which talks about uh, a competitive environment. But I would say that taken together, this new era of technology, renewed ideological competition, and geopolitical competition has really laid the groundwork for a golden age of what we're discussing here, which is uh, political warfare or, or, or gray zone. Let me just uh, cite three examples uh, of this, we've seen Al Qaeda and ISIS, which are very, you know, uh, extreme marginal players on the ideological spectrum, leverage communication technologies to make themselves almost a central part of the global discussion of ideas, which is a, a shocking achievement. Thankfully, their 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 territorial gains have been uh, largely rolled back, but we are still dealing with the after effects of how effectively they were able to leverage technology to gain a platform for these very ma marginal and extreme ideas. Um, second, the example of Crimea, which has already come up today, is I think an excellent example of all of these things coming together. The uh, range of techniques that were employed both on the information spectrum to the military spectrum um, and including on the ideological spectrum that came together in Crimea was really, I think, a galvanizing moment for many of us that it, it really drove home how powerful a tool this can be. And then lastly, I would say that both the internal politics of authoritarian states, everything from the uh, social index that we see emerging in China to some of the debates we're having on the uses of commercial technologies and social media platforms in our own uh, country and throughout uh, the industrialized world, these are new paradigms and they're uh, quite uh, difficult to engage with. So th these are examples of this, but I think that this is uh, uh, in some ways a golden age for exploiting technology, information, and communications to change behaviors and to, to engage in uh, political warfare. But we also see it in the uh, commercial sphere and in the pol politics of democracy. So it is, uh, I, I think, a, a, a fundamentally new uh, phenomenon, although, of course, it has uh, historical precedence. So let me shift a little bit to the response, and then I'll close with a few remarks on the Global Engagement Center. So I think that the response and I think this is not as uh, satisfying as some would like to hear, but the response is going to have to be long term. Uh, to cite a historical precedent, I would remind everyone that it really took decades for the West, for the United States, to mount a response to the Cold War, to the, to the challenge of communism across all spectrums. Uh, like that, struggle, I think this will also involve the creation of new institutions. I think we are just at the beginning of this. I'll cite the Global Engagement Center actually as an example of a uh, new institution, a small one, but a new one. But I think that there are going to have to be uh, a considerable number of uh, new institutions created. And that a key role in all of this is going to play uh, uh, research to understand how all of this is working. I think one of my uh, uh, fellow panelists talked about having some humility in that we do not fully understand how all of these things come together. One of the most interesting phenomena right now in the advertising world is that it's very hard to figure out what works and what doesn't in the political world, what works and what doesn't in the hybrid warfare or political warfare world. Uh, there are new groups coming out like the Oxford Internet Institute, which is small but doing highly relevant research. I think that we're going to have to evolve some new academic disciplines that combine a deep understanding of modern communications technologies with an equally deep understanding of 
language and culture, because all of these things are refracted through language and culture and play out very, very differently in Finland or the United States or any other country. And we really have to look at it in that specific um, uh, context. The eventual solution, I think, is going to involve many, many elements from changes in policy. Uh, a, a, a panelist in the previous panel talked about norms, which I think will play a role. There will be technical solutions. There will be legal solutions. It will not be any one thing. It is going to be a, a, a combination of things. So let me close with a few words on the uh, Global Engagement Center. As I said, the Global Engagement Center is an example of a new institution. It was created by Congress um, uh, through the National Defense Authorization Act of 2017. This being a Washington crowd, I'll say it was Section 1287, if anyone wants to look it up. Um, that's where it gets its mandate, which is to lead, synchronize, and coordinate the US government effort to counter propaganda and disinformation. So it has a very broad and sweeping um, uh, mandate. It is still in the very early days. The center has considerable experience working in the counterterrorism field, but it is pulling together budget and personnel on the counter uh, state field. Um, I'm happy to say that it has created what is called the Information Access Fund, which is a uh, part of its mandate. And the Information Access Fund is intended to support primarily civil society, but not only civil society, um, uh, to increase transparency to counter propaganda and disinformation. We've received an uh, initial group of proposals and we're uh, reviewing them and look forward to actually begin uh, supporting this work soon. The center's work is divided into three uh, groups. Part of it is analytic. Part of it is simply to identify what the vulnerable audiences are, what the um, uh, uh, parameters of the problem are, to really try to understand, and particularly from a US perspective, what is most damaging uh, to our national interests. Secondly, as I said, in connection with the Information Access Fund, it is to support partners, civil society, um, uh, allied governments. And lastly, and this is the least glamorous, but probably the most important part of what the center does, it is to coordinate uh, the uh, US government effort. And in this context, what I would say is that there are a huge number of capabilities throughout the US government from international broadcasting to exchanges to public diplomacy to capabilities in our military that can be used against this problem. And I would, I've been searching for a metaphor for the role that the Global Engagement Center will play. Its direct efforts will always be a small part of this broader effort. But you might want to think about it as the conductor of an orchestra. The orchestra obviously plays the music. The music itself is really written in the form of national strategies. It's written in the form of policy, some of which comes from the National Security Council, some of it which comes from departments and agencies. But the role of a, a coordinating uh, body like the Global Engagement Center is to conduct that effort and to make sure it is synchronized and harmonized and having the greatest possible effect together. So I'll leave you with that uh, image and I'll be ready to answer questions after. Daniel, as you were saying that, the image I had was uh, the conductor in Fantasia, I have to right. say. Uh, <laughs> hard to bring all if of the, those if there's a little bit, If together. there's a little bit of magic in it, it's and, also uh, good. Yeah, we need the magic hat. Thank, Thank you, you Phil, please. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Heather. It's a pleasure to be here and back at CSIS and, and working with Heather. I think it's more than 15 years of Don't date us. collaboration uh, with a good friend and, and colleague who uh, is also, uh, as, as I am, dedicated to the, the transatlantic uh, agenda and the importance of, of maintaining uh, what we have built, certainly over the past uh, 75 years, uh, in terms of a, uh, an order and a set of institutions that uh, has maintained a, a peace uh, and a prosperity, frankly, in the, the transatlantic space that would have been uh, not only unprecedented but uh, unimaginable uh, at the end of, of World War II. And now we're faced with another challenge and we will have to deal with um, that challenge as we have so many of the others and, and do that transatlantically uh, with allies uh, and using institutions like NATO and new institutions uh, like the center uh, in Helsinki. Um, it was very fortuitous that I was here in town uh, with General Scaparotti. Uh, I am his deputy in his uh, European command hat. Of course, he has another hat as the Supreme Allied Commander uh, at NATO. And in both hats, he is very much focused on, on this subject. And in fact, we were here in, in uh, Washington uh, for a number of reasons. But the first meeting we had was uh, one Daniel was also at uh, that was focused on this very subject. And there is a lot of uh, whole of government 
uh, looking at this, uh, but certainly UCOM uh, and the commander himself are, are very focused on this. Uh, as if to sort of underscore that theme, uh, every day UCOM Public Affairs puts out a, uh, a sort of summary of uh, key press stories that are germane to our priorities uh, in terms of the work we're doing uh, on our, our lines of effort within the, uh, the area of responsibility, which of course is, is vast and covers you know, 51 <coughs> Uh, countries in Europe, but also uh, uh, Israel, and with, that has kept us kind of busy uh, <laughs> this week. Um, but in that summary, which uh, pinged into my email box uh, just after midnight, um, 6 a.m. Stuttgart time, uh, there were three stories that were particularly interesting. The first was uh, based on public remarks made yesterday by uh, the chief of, of the German domestic intelligence, uh, Mr. Maassen. Uh, who speaks publicly uh, about threats facing Germany and, and the broader uh, Western world, uh, at least annually. Uh, this year, he was very focused uh, with a warning against cyber attacks and the threat of cyber attacks against critical infrastructure uh, and other hybrid threats, as he put it. He described uh, the potential for malware to be planted that would subject Germany to uh, even blackmail below the threshold of real military conflict. And that's very much what we talk about often is, is competition, as colleagues have mentioned, and conflict short of armed combat. And that's very much what the military, what European command, uh, has to focus on. Uh, our German colleague mentioned also, uh, according to the press reports, the need for empowerment uh, technologically and legally. And that brought up a point that, that we discussed uh, on this is as, as European Command and the other parts of the, the U.S. government, the whole of government approach, look at this problem. We need to make sure we have the legal tools as well uh, and address some of these sensitive things because rule of law is critical to what we do. It's what makes uh, our institutions, what makes the West uh, what it has been and, and by maintaining our focus on that, making sure our laws are adapted uh, to be able to deal with these threats, it, it I think gives us uh, an upper hand. Uh, the German uh, intelligence chief also talked about uh, hack back, and I can hear this uh, phrase uh, coming back in, in Germany uh, now. Uh, pushing back, exposing uh, what is being done in so many cases. Um, now, what was notable about his uh, focus on on hybrid threats, uh, including cyber, was that normally for the last several years he has highlighted the real threat to, uh, to Germany being uh, Islamic extremism. Now his priority this year was uh, about cyber attacks, although he noted that ISIS sympathizers as well have used uh, small-scale cyber attacks, mostly in the propaganda sphere, but they could also uh, potentially target critical infrastructure. The second story that, that was right below that, uh, the focus on this, was uh, one that, um, that Michael would perhaps be aware of, and, and his, uh, the UK chief of, of MI5 spoke publicly yesterday as well, where he stated quite categorically, we've heard before, that Russia is trying to undermine European democracies. Uh, that's not news, uh, but it highlighted uh, the, the challenge we face, and I think, uh, as Michael pointed out, uh, we're working very closely with allies like uh, the United Kingdom on that. And the third story I just mentioned briefly is uh, the, uh, about uh, public remarks by the NATO Assistant Secretary General for Intelligence and Security, who also yesterday spoke of, of the need um, not to leave unanswered Moscow's diverse hybrid attacks on democracies. And he underscored, as a NATO uh, Secretary General should, that partners and allies are key. Uh, he also noted that we're not talking just about Russia here at all. We're talking about China, as we heard in the earlier panel. We're talking about Iran and others who are acting also in Europe, in the European theater. Um, so hybrid unconventional war techniques, uh, gray zone is not the term that we tend to use uh, in Europe. Uh, it tends to be hybrid. Um, but it's all talking about the same thing, uh, overt, covert, um, We've heard a lot of the key, the key points here, and it's what we are embracing, a civil military approach to this 
just the fact that uh, the commander of, uh, of U.S. forces in Europe has a deputy, a civilian deputy, I have a three-star uh, military deputy colleague as well, uh, illustrates uh, how important General Scaparati feels this whole of government approach is. The close liaison with the State Department, with the European Bureau, uh, we really are, are partnered extremely closely on this and with other elements within state. But across the board, we have a, a directorate at UCOM, which is interagency, uh, includes everything from justice to treasury to USAID. And all of these tools are going to be uh, useful. All of the things they bring to the table are, are important. Um, and we have made it uh, in line with the national security strategy, the national military strategy, and of course the uh, national defense strategy. Each of these uh, important documents um, prioritizes this, and, and we're applying that uh, very much. I just mentioned uh, that one of the ways we, I think, have agreed interagency to approach this is with positive messaging. It's not just uh, about uh, countering and exposing, but also having a, a positive message. And I think that was something we knew through USIA and, and uh, others through the Cold War was very important, not to counter negative messages with, with negatives, to counter it with truth, but to have a positive message. And uh, included in some of the talks last week were also the Broadcasting Board of Governors, which I think has an opportunity to restart some of the programs that were pushed aside uh, when we decided those things weren't as important as we realized uh, that is, is important to um, you know, pursue true information, uh, tell the, the American and the Western story, uh, programs for media literacy, strategic outreach, uh, and diplomatic engagement. I think I, I sense across the State Department, even in the last few weeks, a, a renewed sense of the importance of engaging, showing up, uh, being a, a part of this, because we do have uh, challenges uh, to our security and our prosperity coming in new forms. Uh, as my colleagues have said, uh, and certainly European Command, which has transformed itself literally in the last uh, year or so from a command that supported uh, the alliance, uh, enabled uh, global operations, um, was one of more defense cooperation, into uh, being once again a war fighting command. Not that we want to fight wars in the traditional sense, but the fact that we need to be prepared uh, to, to do so, to, uh, to defend our interests, our allies, um, but also to deal with uh, these hybrid uh, aspects of what many are calling a war that is going on today. So I'll leave it there and we can talk Phil, more questions. Thank you so much for great interventions. I, I just have a couple questions I'd love to tease out uh, for our panelists. We circled around it in the first panel, and I'm going to come back. I, I think we are fundamentally not organized to address this challenge set hybrid. After 9-11, we fundamentally reorganized ourselves, uh, creating the Director of National <coughs> Intelligence, creating uh, the Counterterrorism <coughs> Center, fusion centers. We, we took it upon ourselves, and we had a 9-11 commission, a con congressionally mandated to fix what's broken. We have not bring, brought any sense of urgency to this. As much as I respect the Global Engagement Center and what it's trying to do, it is moving too slowly. There's no urgency. And so I just, for reflections from the panel, just we can work our way down. And, and Daniel, it's, it's a pass. You don't have to say anything. <laughs> I, I appreciate you've got talking points and you're doing a great job. Um, but Michael, after, after what we've seen, and the other sort of little point I want to make for you, I'm wondering if we are seeing an increase in tactics by Russia particularly, because in 2006, after Litvinenko, there was not this full-bodied expulsion. There was not this dramatic impact. More killings later, now we have a big impact. Are we not, we're being probed, we're not responding. So Russia goes, oh, okay, we can keep probing and seeing, and then we get a very big, response to that. So how is the UK organizing itself to handle Russian malign influence? If there's any tips you can give the US government, that would be fantastic. And then do you sense that this uh, increase in activity and aggression, I would argue, was because there was perhaps not the robust response when this began happening in the UK over a decade ago? 
Okay, thank you. Two interesting <laughs> sorry, questions. I, I, I <laughs> sorry presume that. to give advice to the State Department. But, oh, yes, um, you, you can. Uh, I give you license too. Uh, on the first point, uh, I, I, I think I basically agree with what you say, that uh, it feels to me as though in lots of areas, Russia is testing uh, the West. It's testing to see what it can get away with. Um, and if it feels like it is getting away with it, then you'll probably see that sort of activity uh, recur um, or intensify. Um, so I think uh, it is very important that when we're tested, we show that we're responding uh, to that test. And that again, as I come back to the, the collective uh, international response uh, to Salisbury, where I think that you know, was uh, uh, the right, very serious response to a very serious um, provocation. And uh, my sense, and I hope I'm right, is that Russia will have looked at that response and thought that's more than we were, uh, we were expecting. That's more than we factored in uh, when we were planning this operation. And this kind of thing isn't worth doing because look what happens. Um, we unite uh, all of, uh, of the Western uh, community uh, of countries, and we uh, pay a severe price in terms of expulsions and, and everything else um, that followed. So when we're tested, uh, it's important that we uh, make our adversaries, Russia or whoever, uh, realize that we are ready to respond uh, to, uh, to that test. And I think that response needs to be uh, an enduring one. I think it was, was Philip who was talking about, you know, the, the, or maybe it was Daniel, I can't remember, but the, the need for long-term uh, approaches uh, here. Uh, I think we need to make uh, Russia realize that when it behaves in outrageous ways that, that violate international norms and the rules-based uh, international order, they will pay an enduring uh, price for that. Um, I think uh, for me this is one of the lessons that needs to be learnt from the Georgia experience in, uh, in 2008 where Russia did something pretty outrageous. There was a, a wave of, uh, of indignation and angry uh, uh, reaction but pretty soon after that um, uh, we moved into a different phase of policy making and reset and so on. And it seems to me entirely possible that Russia drew the conclusion that it could do very provocative things. Um, and after a while, the sort of indignation uh, would recede and, and people would be ready to draw a line on, under it. And, and if that was the case, then I think it's very important that we don't allow that, uh, uh, that perception uh, to keep recurring. Um, the second question you asked me about organization, I, I, I think you're right that this uh, the, the sort of gray zone activity um, will uh, poses a big challenge uh, to governments and it puts a premium uh, on joined upness uh, and coordination uh, within governments and governments that can't sort of respond to that challenge and that, that remain operating in kind of siloed uh, ways will, will pay a price. If you look at the sort of pattern of uh, Russian activity, it, 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 it really does require a whole of government uh, approach, uh, obviously from uh, the foreign ministry, from the defense ministry, from the agencies, from uh, finance ministries in, in uh, respect of, uh, of sanctions, um, in, in, in some cases in, in the ministries that deal with media and, and information regulation because of what we see happening in, uh, in the disinformation uh, space. So it is very important uh, that, that governments are, are able to sort of take a, a strategic approach that straddles all the different areas and that brings all the different arms uh, of government um, together. Uh, and in the UK, I mean, I'm not saying there's any particular magic to what we did, but um, we tried to come up with uh, a single strategic framework that analyzed the challenge, that analyzed the set of, of, of policy responses that were needed to that, and enabled all the different bits of government to locate their activity within that strategy and provided frameworks at which we could come together uh, and review what we were doing and to judge which bits of it were uh, effective uh, and, and, and which bits weren't. And to spot if two different bits of government were working on the same area 
uh, in, in different ways or overlapping ways or, 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 or conflicting uh, ways. But your basic point is absolutely right. This does confront governments with a challenge and I think the answer to that challenge is uh, more joined upness uh, and, and coordination uh, across all arms of government. Easier said than done. Uh, if I want to a second, Hannah, just putting your uh, Finnish hat on fully, not the European Center. Has the Finnish government organized itself in a particular way to address hybrid issues? Help us. Maybe there's some good examples because you've been yeah. a, a practitioner for decades. Um, <clears throat> I haven't been practitioner for decades, but working together with the practitioners. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I meant. Yes. Finland has been a practitioner for decades. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so. Um, the, the thing um, about the Finnish government, that even if we have had the whole of kind of government, whole of society, so-called so -called comprehensive security model, it has been recognized also that this, uh, these changes that has been happening all uh, around us um, in the security environment um, do challenge even that rather watertight uh, cooperation between the different um, entities. And the reason there is that that model has been designed for a crisis situation. So in case there is not a, a officially a crisis situation, that model doesn't necessarily kick in. So uh, what in Finland was done was to identify uh, these certain weaknesses relating to that. And in fact, Finland has put a lot of emphasis on legal resilience. One of the reasons there has been, of course, this thing that since um, in today, today's uh, this phenomenon, what we're talking about, uh, hybrid threat, um, gray zone activity, etc., uh, attribution is for countries that has a normative framework, rule of law based um, action, is very difficult. But in case you actually look at it in a legal way, um, it doesn't matter who's behind it, if it's illegal action, you can take then uh, measures to counter it, because that can be stopped. So, so in that way, to use also the legal framework there. The second thing what has been done um, is to organize the government. In fact, using also the legal aspect in the way that there is a law now in Finland, that, that all the ministries need to report to one entity uh, in a government, of all kind of actions, even if you don't know exactly what, what that is, but, but just as long as you kind of identify something which is unusual, um, which has, han has not happened before. And then that center uh, starts putting these issues together so that it can look at that, okay, social ministry reported something weird going on there. Then suddenly there is a, from the financial ministry um, mentioning uh, relating to economic activity something um, and possibly then even the Minister of Justice says that they have uh, identified something. So in this center they can put these dots together and start then looking at okay why is these weird things happening? Are they connected or are they separate? Because this is of course one of the big challenges also that how uh, things are connected or not. This, this gives us the tools for, for the responses, because if we respond to everything uh, in the way that, oh, it has to be Russia, then it might go totally wrong. Um, so we have to identify the, the real threats, the real action in it, um, and then also remember that there is a lot of other things going on. Well, and Phil, I want to turn to you because that to me in defense purposes speaks to indications and warnings. How can you get a sense of these strange things that are happening that seem very disconnected, but in fact they may be pointing to uh, a broader attack? How does, how does UCOM organize itself when it starts seeing something? It's, uh, so the US, uh, US forces in Poland start getting a sense that something is happening strange. They're coordinating with the US Embassy in Warsaw, other embassies. How does that work in UCOM? That's, that's very much it. I mean, there's been a great uptick in, in looking at these things. You have to guard against getting uh, too paranoid, but uh, you know, some would say you can't be too paranoid. Um, certainly having spent a lot of time in the Western Balkans, uh, that's part of the, the, the name of the game. But um, we do look very carefully. Obviously, there's a, a key role for the intelligence community. And our intelligence community, as you know, is, is vast with a lot of different capabilities, different types of capabilities. 
Uh, all of those need to, to play into it. But I think it's also important to note uh, something that, that um, Hannah mentioned, and that is not just whole of government, but whole of society. And uh, you know, that is whole of government plus engagement from the private sector, from Church. academia, mm -hmm. perhaps civil society. The institutions uh, need to be aware of this, first of all, uh, and attuned to it. Um, and you know, you're seeing this with uh, the look at the technology and the social media sector, Facebook, uh, you know, up before Congress testifying, but discussions about how do we need to adapt laws to deal with this, but also how can we get these people to be players and look at a national interest um, and, and an interest that of course is, is uh, international in the sense of international organizations, like-minded governments, uh, and, and we have NATO, we have partners, Finland and Sweden, two of the most active partners with NATO right now, and that includes in, in this area. So um, it's a, very much a comprehensive approach, but you have to look at everything. Uh, one that I don't think has been mentioned, one tool uh, that Russia employs is energy supply manipulation. Uh, that can be right. critical. Um, Ross Adam is a political tool uh, as much as anything. Um, and we have to be keenly aware of that and make sure that others are aware of it too. So Daniel, maybe you can help us understand how the Global Engagement Center, when you're focusing perhaps on a specific Russia malign influence question, I know you do you know, mm -hmm. much more broadly sure. global counterterrorism, how does the mechanics of that work? The Global Engagement Center calls an interagency discussion, mm -hmm. they're li just lightly give sure. us the mechanics of how it actually works. Sure, so let me structure this around the three categories of activity which are analytics, support, and coordination, and with the caveat that we are ramping up in some of the nation state areas, um, uh, but the, 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 it's sort of all of the above. So there are, of course, interagency meetings. You know, the, the everyday business of coordination really boils down to email and meetings. Um, uh, it's not glamorous, it's not exciting, and it's generally invisible. And the better it is done, the more invisible it is. So that's really knowing who all of the players are and knowing who they are across a very wide spectrum because, as my colleague said, some of these players are actually not in government. Some of the most powerful voices can come from civil society. There's an extremely important uh, role played by the tech sector, by some of the major platforms. There's an important role played by some of the smaller platforms, some of whom we might not talk to directly, but an interlocutor in the bigger tech world might. So the coordination uh, uh, thing is really, this is one of the areas where the uh, uh, engagement part comes in. I remind our uh, staff sometimes when they're in the office too much that the E stands for engagement. And we have to get out to events like this. We have to get out to uh, meet colleagues in other governments. So the coordination part involves, and this is going to be different for each of the uh, problem sets. So the community that engages with Russian malign influence, influence is different than the community that looks at how Iran uh, conducts influence. The way that they do it is different. The cast of characters is different. So the coordination piece is knowing who the players are, having the right venues, and you can't, th there's no single venue where you can have all the players in the same room. It, it doesn't, doesn't work that way. There are multiple venues even within government. There are some forums where it is easier to talk to the military and the intelligence community. There are others where you can engage, say, within a, a international broadcasting. So the coordination piece is knowing the players and having existing venues where you can all either communicate through an email or a phone call or you can come together when there's a galvanizing event or you simply know who each other are when you're monitoring an event that is that is in progress. So that's the coordinating piece and the important thing to remember is that these communities of interest are going to be different for each of the problem sets. Okay. Secondly, there's the support Piece. And the support piece involves identifying um, uh, civil society organizations, research organizations, and allied governments, I would say, are the three most uh, uh, powerful uh, allies, but not the only allies. There are some uh, institutions that are a combination. So luckily we have mechanisms like the Information Access Fund where we can accept proposals and then we can fund organizations. We also work with other parts of the U.S. government that provide assistance. This includes uh, USAID. It includes includes other offices in the State Department. There's a both coordinating and supporting function to this, so we know who else is doing this. So that 
is sort of the second major uh, tool in the toolbox. And then the one that I really should have cited first is this analytic tool. And that's everything from monitoring social media, mapping the landscape, to having enough familiarity with the historical literature so we understand the repertoire of tools that, say, the Kremlin uses, which have been updated to take advantage of modern technology, but in a lot of their uh, uses really go back to sort of classics like Operation Infection and, and these things. So it's those three buckets, and you know, the way that works in uh, countering Russian influence is very different than it is going to be in the others. But it's those it's it's, it's those three major buckets. Thank you. Let's uh, invite uh, questions for our audience. We have about ten minutes, and then the question I want you to think about is how do you see Russian influence adapting itself? My theory, and you can uh, test my theory. Uh, is it uh, over time we're going to see Russian influence less look less Russian and much more American, British, German, and I just would love your thoughts on countering when it actually comes from within. So yes, we have lots of good hands up, so I'll take the two back there. If you could introduce yourself, your affiliation, and a quick question, then we'll get to those answers. Sure. Yes, ma'am. My, my name is Kara Jones. I work at an organization called ORB International. We do public opinion research, evaluation, and other forms of research. So my question is really about accountability. So it, it comes in two forms. So one, how do we know what our disinformation programs and what our efforts that we're doing it remains accountable to taxpayers and um, other entities with vested interests? And then how do we know our results? How do we show results? How do we show impacts from what our programming is doing to actually having a measurable impact in the world? Accountability and efficacy, always big challenges. Donna, we'll just write there as well. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, I'm David Ensor. Um, I run something called the Project for Media and National Security at the George Washington University. I'm a former VOA director. Um, and, and I'd like to ask our two European representatives uh, to talk a little bit about social media. I'm wondering, I, mean, I remember reading a lot uh, years ago about uh, Europe being much tougher on privacy issues in terms of what Facebook and Twitter and Google and other American large social media companies and digital companies represented. Um, does Europe, is Europe ahead of us in ways that would be useful for us to hear about in terms of regulating social media as platforms that are being used by the opponents of Western democracies to undermine them? Are there things we could learn from Europe as a whole or Britain or others in terms of how to regulate these, these, these platforms. It seems to me that the, the, the engineers who started companies like Facebook and Twitter have, are now having to recognize they can't just say, oh, I'm just a platform. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Whatever's up there, that's not my responsibility. It seems to me it is their responsibility, and so I'd like to know what other countries are doing about it. Thanks. I think we can take one more there, sir. Thank you. Hi, I'm Justin Ziegler from uh, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, so there's been a lot of talk about creating alliances and countering this kind of disinformation and gray zone tactics. Uh, where does that fit in with talk in Europe about a two-speed EU and, let's say, uh, rogue actors like Poland that's moving away from rule of law? How, do, how does an alliance fit in with those sorts of uh, problems? Thank you. Three fantastic questions. I might even add, Michael, to your list to talk about the regula uh, regulations on uh, RT and Sputnik, something that the British government has been uh, looking at as well. So I think we'll just work our way down the line. You probably each have about two minutes to uh, take care of some great questions. Michael, I'll turn to you first. Um, RT and Sputnik. Um, the. Uh, it's a topical issue, a lot of discussion uh, about it. Um, our view is that we have uh, a regulatory environment in the UK, in the media space. We have an independent uh, body called Ofcom, which uh, monitors and is responsible for upholding that uh, environment. Um, anyone can uh, refer uh, a perceived uh, instance of, of, of mispractice um, to Ofcom, and Ofcom will, will rule on that. Um, and 
So our, you know, our instinct is to, to use that uh, framework. And that framework um, has been uh, applied uh, in respect of, of RT. Uh, and Ofcom has ruled against uh, RT uh, for, I, I can't remember the precise terms, for, for biased or, or unobjective or mischievous um, uh, reporting. Um, so our, our preference is to, to rely on that regulatory framework rather than to kind of close down uh, organizations um, from operating uh, in, uh, in the media space, certainly as a sort of first uh, uh, approach. Um, very good question on, on social media. I confess I'm not an expert on this, so I wouldn't like to comment on uh, whether Europe is ahead or, uh, or behind uh, the US. Um, I mean, I think this is, as, uh, this is something that's very relevant in the, the sort of counter-terrorism uh, space, uh, in, in, in the non-state actor um, space. I think, you know, important progress has, uh, has been made uh, recently in Syria in closing down the kind of geographical space um, in which terrorists can operate. I think we need to make sure that, you know, that we're not giving them a sort of free run in, in virtual um, uh, space and although very often um, you know the talk is of lone actors or, or lone wolves you know very often they're, they're not they're not as, as, as lonesome as, as they seem and they're actually part of a kind of online community which is, is, is radicalizing them and encouraging um, extremism so it's a very important topic um, it's one where we uh, in, in the British government um, are looking to work in partnership with the big um, social media companies. Um, our, our former Home Secretary Amber Rudd used to visit the US regularly and go to the West Coast and talk about how government uh, and companies can, uh, can work together uh, jointly on this, this problem. Okay, um, very challenging uh, questions, several of them. Um, I am not 100% sure that I understood uh, uh, the question relating to the accountability and disinformation um, aspect, but I'll answer something, and that doesn't matter whether it's real answer then, but it's at least something. Uh, in relating to um, at least the way how um, we and the center has been looking at it is also the, that when there is um, clear-cut factor that uh, facts are wrong. So is a debunking, for example, uh, the most effective way to try to show that this fact uh, is uh, not right uh, or not, uh, or, or, or that um, it's been used wrongly? Um, the research relating to that is actually not uh, conclusive. It quite often shows that it puts a strength perhaps that almost division sometimes becomes stronger. So the people believe one um, aspect. And that's why I would second the one that in the previous panel talked about uh, not necessarily too much um, putting emphasis on disbunking and, and efforts to the disinformation, but to the kind of being proactive and try to feed in uh, the more kind of um, positive information, your side of the story, uh, and not necessarily in a conflicting way. Um, and this has shown a certain impact when it looks at kind of public opinion polls. So that's at least a, some kind of answer. Relating to the social media, I'm not expert in that one, but Germany does have an example relating to that. They have a, a, a regulation relating to also social platforms and how that can be um, taken down. So at least there, uh, we have a one example. Um, there is inside of the EU uh, uh, plans at the moment relating um, to, to that, uh, that how to regulate it. Um, our own experience has been that, for example, Twitter did take down one account, which was uh, kind of copying, uh, for copyright kind of reasons, copying our almost logo and feeding in information like it would be hybrid co-information, but it wasn't. But Twitter did take wow. it down. So at least, I don't know either how it's in the US, but there are certain examples. And then finally, I do this, how does, um, uh, for the alliance fit in when there is uh, uh, perhaps not liked politics relating to uh, mentioned here, Poland and Hungary. That's a politics and, and power that is talking. Um, as far as I know, um, they have been happening through uh, a democratic mechanisms. So people have voted. It is a question, of course, how 
has perhaps power been taken over by the media or squeezed that? Um, and that is a national responsibility. That is knowledge in all of these countries, actually, uh, the, the information flows work in the way that people can react to it. So it is annoyance. We might not like it. The power is misused as such. Um, but it's still in a parameters of the democratic system. And this, of course, could be argued that it's a weakness or then it is a strength because it has to be tested. People has to decide how it goes. And when it comes to uh, alliances being part of NATO or EU, yes, there's always problems when there are so many countries, so many different relig uh, religions even, and, uh, uh, and kind of ways of strategic cultures and, and so on mixed. But ultimately, both, for example, Poland and Hungary do not want to leave the EU or not leave the NATO. It is more of negotiating tactics for their own uh, situation. So in that way, perhaps we need to look at it a little bit behind the scenes. Uh, so it's not everything uh, is the, the how it looks. So politics and power plays quite a big role in democracies too. Daniel, Phil, our time is almost up, but let me give you two seconds to finish up. Sure, very, very quickly. On accountability, um, uh, our main mechanism of accountability is Congress. Um, uh, we are made specifically uh, reportable to a number of committees on the Hill. We have uh, reports we have to deliver on an annual basis. I am. Uh, on the Hill more often than I've ever been in my career. We provide regular uh, classified and unclassified briefings to the House Foreign Affairs Committee, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So that's a very powerful uh, mechanism for us. And we're also the uh, subject of considerable media scrutiny. So that enforces uh, accountability. Just very quickly on effectiveness, um, we are uh, doing our best to make sure that all of the best practices of measures of effectiveness are integrated into our selection criteria for proposals. We've uh, involved a fairly large uh, range of offices and colleagues in our selection panels. Um, and once again, we regularly uh, brief our uh, programs to uh, Congress uh, for their um, uh, review. Bill. Just a final thought. I, I think um, it, it's, you've got to remember it's going to be long term. I mean, we've heard that in both panels. Uh, this is not a quick fix uh, situation. Uh, these are things that have evolved over time. We look at it from UConn, we talk about being currently in phase zero. Uh, and we're constantly being tested with uh, new techniques and, and somewhere in sort of the space between, between crisis and, and war. The hybrid threats have always existed. They existed in the Cold War. Uh, we fought them with different tools. The, the difference now is, is globalization, and globalization has been weaponized uh, through the commerce, the rapid spread of, uh, of information, et cetera, that we've heard about. Let's not fixate too much on matrices of effectiveness you know, in this fiscal year. Let's look at a big picture and what we're trying to accomplish with our alliances and, and keep in mind what it is that uh, is concerning about this. And it goes from the information sphere, the, the, the values, the ideas, the narrative, but it also, uh, in terms of hybrid, goes to uh, true uh, acts of war. If you can turn out someone's lights, uh, if you can disrupt uh, uh, an infrastructure or a uh, logistics network, um, that can be perilous uh, in much more traditional concepts of, uh, of war. And, uh, and threat. Absolutely, Thanks. long term, big picture. Two thank yous. Thank you to the Finnish uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs for allowing us to have such an in depth, rigorous discussion with fantastic panelists. Thank you. Uh, CSIS is trying to model the uh, best response to hybrid, which is whole of CSIS collaboration <laughs> with Dr. Kath Hicks and the International Security Program. We're so grateful and a big thank you to our four panelists who helped us understand organizational challenges the long term and I hope you'll come back soon. Thank you for joining us today. Thank Fabulous. You.